was before, but uh, yeah. Now I started the recording already. Cool. I'll mute and let you carry on. All right. I'll just wait for everybody to join in. How many people do we have right now? Mm, I'm not going to count. <laughs> A bit. I already saw one shirtless guy on this WebEx. Yeah, that's, I'm just waiting for everybody to join in. I can share the screen. Chat, and the chat is also not that small one, but I can see it. Recording's on. All right. More and more people are joining in, so. Are you are you sure about the recording? Just in case, I, I don't actually see anything on here, but I usually see it. it's, it's got that uh, the recording button right next to the you are sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, you cool. I, yeah, I don't see it. it. Whatever you you actually see as part of the WebEx window won't actually translate over to here. Like we just see it as like empty space. So, uh, but worst case scenario, we'll probably have Alex R uh, recording since he was the guy who saved the day the last time. All right. No, but it says uh, you're. Uh, it says it's recording right now. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Thanks. Should I start then? Everybody here. Oh yeah, we have plenty of people now. Good enough to get started. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. The plan today is to take a look at BGP. Okay, thanks, Joseph. In BGP, we'll take a look at the purpose of BGP. That's very important to understand. <clears throat> we'll take a look at eBGP. We'll take a look at iBGP. We'll do in under IBGP, we'll take a look at things like update source or redundancy, I'll say. We shall take a look at your next top attribute, an important attribute over here. We'll take a look at your route reflector. Once this is done, we'll also take a look at authentication of BGP. Once BGP is done, we'll take a look at MPLS unicast routing. Here, we'll take a look at LDP. And we shall also take a look at running BGP with MPLS unicast routing. We are not going to do MPLS VPNs, but <coughs> Basic MPLS unicast routing, we'll take a look at. This is called unicast routing. If we get a chance, we'll get into ISIS. So this will be an asterisk depending on time. So getting right into it, because we've already wasted about 25 minutes, what is the purpose of BGP? That's the first thing that I want you guys to do. Most of the time, what we do is we have a habit of comparing BGP with an IGP. The purpose of BGP was to connect two different autonomous systems to each other, basically connecting two different companies to each other. Its purpose is not to run within your company. Its purpose was to run on the edges of the company, hence the word order, gateway, protocol. 
it runs on the borders, that it's meant to run on the borders. It's a unicast based protocol in the sense that you need to specify who your neighbors are manually, statically. <clears throat> so for example, over here, if I'm running BGP on the edges over here, I would still need to run some form of what? IGP on the inside. Rado 2, which is also running the same IGP, will learn the routes over here in the normal routing table. And that's where BGP steps in. Its job is to allow it to connect up, advertise the routes that are within its autonomous system with the devices in other autonomous systems. So BGP would be running between R1, R2, and R3 to exchange routes from the different autonomous systems. And these autonomous systems generally on the internet are your service providers. So these are your service providers that are connecting to each other, exchanging routes with each other, using BGP as a protocol. So IGP is running inside your autonomous system. BGP is running on the edge or between the two different autonomous systems. In terms of the category of the protocol, IGP, which if you want to give examples over there, your IGPs are what? The ones that we've gone through in this class, RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, we haven't covered ISIS yet, but ISIS, these are your IGPs. Your BGP falls under a category called EGP, in which you used to have a protocol called EGP and then BGP. This one is no longer there, it's like IGRP. When the person who said BGP was an application a couple of days, I think he meant that it's an, yeah, but that uh, RIP is the same in that sense. All right, so the protocol BGP, if I had to compare it, I would have compared it with EGP, but EGP does not exist. So BGP is the protocol in its own category. Does that make sense, guys? Everybody okay with this? So BGP runs on the outside. Now, if you take a look at my outline over here, you will notice that I have mentioned something about what? EGP and IGP. Okay? E, sorry, EG, EBGP and IBGP. Why is that? What is IBGP then? I'll explain that to you guys. Let's take a look at this real quick. Where did I go? Yeah, somebody's video is on. Amir? Amir? Okay, there you go. It's gone. Now, let me explain this. What is the purpose of IBGP so you guys understand that? So you understand what the purpose and why would I want to run IBGP over here? Let's say I have these autonomous systems over here. We'll start with AS1, AS2, and AS3. Router 1, Router 2, and Router 3. Although I'm just showing you one router over here in AS1, AS2, and AS3, assume that there's a bunch of different routers that are within the company. The rep representative router for AS1 is 1, for 2 is 2, 3 is 3. When I set up a relationship between 1, 2, and 3 like that, I'll bring the second one in and play in a second. When I set up a neighbor relationship between them like this, between one, two, and three, they exchange routes with each other. When I exchange a route with each other, let's take one as an example. I have a network one dot zero dot zero dot zero slash eight over here. I'll send that route to AS2 and AS3 via R2 and R3. Along with the route, BGP sends a very important attribute or the AS path. AS path is an attribute in BGP 
that basically marks the AS it belongs to and any AS that the route has propagated through. So for example, if the route was originated from AS1, in the AS task right now, you would see one over here, which was propagated to two and to three. So right now on, what do you call it, AS2, which is router two, you're gonna have network one, slash eight, via R1 with an AS pass of what? One. Similarly, R3 will get the same route via R1 with an AS pass of one. Because R2 and R3 are neighbors with each other, they also exchange one with each other, which is fine. When R2 gets it, R2 says, oh, I'm also getting the same route via what? R3. But what R3 would do is he received the AS pass with AS pass one. When three sends it to, three sends it to two, three prepends his AS number in the AS pass. So when a router sends a route to a neighboring AS, the router will attach its own AS prepended in the AS pass. So for example, AS pass over here that router three got was one. When three sends it to two, he's gonna prepend his AS number over here. Okay, try to keep your mics off, please. All right. So when router three sends it to one, he prepends his AS number over here. So the AS path over here on router two for network one via R3 is three and one. Everybody okay with that? You understand that? Now, because router two sees the same path with, between two from two, two different neighbors, it needs to pick the best route. And the way it picks the best route right now is based on the shortest AS path. There are a bunch of different attributes that you can also use to select the best route. But for right now, we're gonna keep it simple. And I'll say that I'm receiving the route based on, I'm gonna pick the best route based on the default parameter, which is the AS path, okay? So the AS path that is the shortest is the one selected, which is R2 to R1. It's like our AS hop. So the least number of AS hops is the one that I select. So it still stays in your backup table. The backup table in BGP is known as a BGP table, or which is basically not backup table, but the complete table, like your LSA database or your topology table. That table over here is known as a BGP table. Good so far? Similarly, over here on R3, I'm gonna receive one via R2, but R2. To get to the network one, on these guys is also the direct path. Why is it the direct path? Because it's the shortest AS path. Agreed? Everybody understand that? So on both routers, router one and router three, sorry, router two and router three, I have received the same route from R1. R1 was coming in. From where? R1 was sending the network one direct. So his AS path was a single AS, which is one. R1 sent the same AS to R3. Came route to R3. R3 again received it with a single AS. They sent R2 and R3 exchanged the routes with each other. When they exchanged the routes with each other, they prepend their AS number in there. So the AS path for the same route that 
I received directly from R1, same route that I received from R3, would have an AS path of 3N1. Similarly, on R3, I will have the AS path as 2N1. So I'm receiving one on R3 from one and from two. On R2, I'm receiving the same network one from one as well as from three. Which path would I take to get from R2 to R1 or R3 to R1 for this network one? You get my point? The direct one. From R2 to R1 or R3 to R1 would be the direct path. Agreed? Okay. But I do have the backup path in my table. Now, let's say the network one is lost. This network over here is lost. R1 tells R2 and R1 tells R3, hey, listen, I lost my network one. What does R2 or R3 do with that network? It pulls this network off, but it does have a second route in the BGP table. What is the second route from? From the other side, he does not know that R3, it's the same route that has been pulled off. He thinks it's another path. So what R2 does is says, okay, I'll install this in my routing table. And then pushes this route back to R1. What does R1 do over here with it? R1 receives the same route, its own route, 1.0.0.0 slash 8 via R2 right now. But what does the AS path look like? What does the AS path look like over here? It started from one, it went to three, and then it put two over here, right? Because two would prepend his AS number over there. Originating AS is always at the end. The next AS is right after that, and the front AS is the, the closest AS. Either way, when R1 receives a route, it checks the incoming route's AS path. If it finds his own AS over here, What's that an indication of for R1? It's my own route coming back. This route has gone through me at any given, at some given point. That's why this particular AS is in there. So by default, the router one will discard this route, say, hey, there's a, race, a racing condition where at my route that I lost has not actually gone gotten into router two. That's why he's sending me this information. I should discard this route. The reason I'm discarding the route is this route has my own AS in there. That means that this route has gone through me. You guys understand that? So let me write this down for you guys. So the loop avoidance mechanism in BGP AS path number would be your AS number, right? So every AS that I go to will be added in that AS path. So it went from one to two, so the AS path get, got it, uh, put in as one and two. If it went, goes from two to three, the AS path will add the next AS. So if a route comes back to me, I know it's my route because my AS number will be in there. So one of the attributes that you have over here is in BGP is the BGP AS path attribute. This attribute is an important attribute as it does two things for you. What are the two things it does? Number one, it is used by BGP as a best path selection criteria, but this is not the only one. There's other ones, but this is one of them. Shortest AS path, right? The other one, which is more important to me, is it is used 
as a loop prevention mechanism. Make sense, guys? So I need to maintain this AS path as I go through my system. Everybody okay with that? Now, let's take a look at another topology, and this is where I want to make sure you guys understand the importance of IBGP. Let's say I have this type of setup. AS1, pay attention guys over here. AS2, and I had AS4. Router 1 was a representative of AS1. Router 2 was a representative of AS2. And I had Router 4 representing AS4. But at the same time, the way my neighbor relationships were done, they were done like this, R1 to R2, R1 to R4, but 2 was not connecting to 4. I had a separate router in my domain, R3, which was setting up a neighbor relationship between AS2 and AS4. Got it so far? You understand this so far? Now the problem over here is, I'm running BGP where? On the edges? Remember what I told you, it is called the border gateway protocol allowing two autonomous systems to connect to each other. It was not meant to run where? In the inside, you would run some form of an IGP inside. Okay, so far so good. Now I received the route, let's say I got network one, sent to me by this guy. Good. Two needs to send the route to three. I'm not running BGP over here. I'm running some form of an IGP. What? Give me an example of an IGP that they can run within my autonomous system. OSPF, ISIS, EIGRP, any of those, right? Any of these, uh, what do you call it? IGPs. Let's run OSPF over here. So let's say I have a couple of routers over here. Router X router Y, and then I have router 3. Good so far? So I got the route 1 over here. I need to send it to 3 so that 3 will send the route to 4. So if I receive the route as a BGP route and I want to send it to 3 and I'm running OSPF in the middle, what do I need to do on R2 to get the route from BGP into OSPF? I need to redistribute the route, right? Do you guys remember what happened to my metrics, my attributes yesterday when I did the redistribution? Remember it takes on the metric of the new routing protocol. It loses the old metrics. Right? Okay. So if it lost the old metrics, what happened to the AS path that I had received along with it? So the AS path over here was one, which was used as a loop avoidance mechanism. When I redistributed that route into OSPF, what happened was I lost the AS path metric. So now this becomes an OSPF E2 route 1.0.0.0 slash 8. Gets propagated from R2 to Rx. Rx to Ry, Ry sends it to R3. R3 receives it as an OSPF external route. Now I need to send that route into BGP. So what do I do over here now? Again, redistribute the route from where? From OSPF into BGP. When I send that route into BGP, the 1.0.0.0 slash 8 network, what is the AS path going to look like now? It's originating from AS2, right? My AS number is 2. No, this, the whole thing, R2, Rx, Ry, R3 are all in AS2. That's why I'm running an IGP over here, right? So AS path would just say 2. 
So when I send the route over here, R1 would have received a route over here from, sorry, R4 would have received the route from here via R1, AS path would be one. And I would have received the same route via what? R3, AS path is two. Now it goes into the BGP path selection criteria and it selects one of those routes. That's not that important to me. Even then it might lead to suboptimal routing. I might use this path and get there or I might take this path and get there. That's not important. The important part is, let's say something happens to network one, the same situation happened. He sends an update saying, hey, listen, this network that I had is gone to R2. He sends the same message to us. R4, my network is gone. What does R4 do? R4 pulls the route out and puts R3 as the best route and propagates this route over here telling me, hey, listen, you lost network one. I'll tell you about network one. Now he sends the route to him as what? 1.0.0.0 slash 8 via what? R4 with an AS path of what? What does the AS path look like now? It originated from 2, according to him, and went from 4, so 4 and 2. Will AS1 accept that path? Yes. So my loop avoidance technique is gone. You understand that? So I am susceptible to loops over here. So what they needed to do is to maintain my AS path attribute from where? From one edge to the other edge. You get my point? So that's where they came up with a protocol called IBGP, whose purpose was not to do the main functionality of BGP. What's the main functionality of BGP? The main functionality of BGP is to connect two autonomous systems, border gateway protocol. But the, that is eBGP. I call it the real BGP. Exterior BGP, that is connecting two different autonomous systems to each other. The purpose, what I would do over here is I would have to run BGP where? From R2 to R3. Not necessarily directly connected, they might have what? Multiple routers in the middle, but I would form a neighbor relationship because IBGP neighbor relationships can be formed as long as I have reachability to the other router. So he's going to send a BGP update from R2 with an IP address destination IP address of the route update of R3. Sends the packet to R3, R3 gets it. So I'm going to form a BGP neighbor relationship between what? from R2 to R3. What's the purpose of that? The main purpose of this BGP, uh, what do you call it? Name relationship is to get the route from one edge to another edge without losing what? Any of the BGP attributes so that Three now can, if it had a neighbor relationship with over here, he can easily send the route to what? Four without losing the attributes. And this form of BGP, which is run internally within the autonomous system, is known as IBGP. What was the purpose of IBGP? Its purpose is not really to do the connectivity part of it, it's just to allow the routes to be propagated from one edge of the autonomous system to the other edge without losing BGP attributes because BGP really was meant to connect two different autonomous systems to each other. Do you understand that? So you need to make sure you understand the focus of BGP is to connect two different autonomous systems to each other. It needs the help of IBGP so that it does not lose any attributes within the autonomous system, hence the need for running BGP within the autonomous system. <clears throat> IBGP is not a protocol that you want to use within your autonomous system. I, router, router 2 bec uh, became, becomes a default gateway for BGP. 
not relevant over here. Don't focus on what I'm telling you over here. Don't worry about the default gateway. Understand the purpose over here for right now. So let me write that down in terms of the purpose over here. So BGP as a protocol is used to connect two autonomous systems to each other. That is the real purpose of BGP. When you, let me just put them as bullets. When you connect two routers to each other using BGP that are in two different autonomous systems, it is called E or exterior BGP. Good? This is the real BGP. All right? Then you also have you also need to run BGP within the autonomous system. The purpose of that is to maintain the BGP attributes from one edge to another edge so that the AF path attribute is maintained. All right? When you run BGP from one edge of the AS to another in the same AS. It is called I or interior BGP or internal BGP. EBGP is Batman. High BGP is Robin. So don't think that they're the same. You understand that? IBGP is supporting the main purpose of BGP, which is to allow two different autonomous systems to talk to each other. The purpose of IBGP is I want to maintain end-to-end -end, uh, reachability, not reachability, but uh, at main connectivity or the flow of the attributes from one end to the other. So that's why I run IBGP. So if I had something like this, I have one AS over here, AS1, which goes through a big AS, which has one router over here, one router over here, and then another autonomous system, and there are multiple routers in the middle. Then I go to another autonomous system, I go to another autonomous system. My BGP attributes are not lost within the autonomous system. That's where I run IBGP to maintain those attributes, but the main purpose of BGP is this. Agreed? You understood the purpose. The first thing that is very important to understand is the purpose of BGP. Why do I have E? Why do I have I? A lot of people think that IBGP is there so that it can compete with other protocols like OSPF, ISIS, and EIGRP. It's not meant for that. If you look at the admin distance for, which is basically like a priority of different protocols, IBGP has a priority of 200. Whereas Protocols like EIGRP have 90, you have uh, OSPF at one, 110, and then you have ISIS at 115, RIP is 110, 120. You understand the, so this is like, don't use this as a protocol within your autonomous system. One edge, one edge of the AS to another 
in the same airs. Thank you. One edge of the airs to another in the same airs. Got it? So router one to router two. My objective over here will, to sh will be to show you how to run EVGP, and then I'll show you how to run IVGP, and also authenticate it. At the end of this, you will be able to set this topology up where I have multiple ASs. My main AS, that is my AS that I'll be working with is AS1000. This is where I'm gonna show you how to run IVGP. The link between one and four, one and seven, three and seven, three and six, six and seven, four and seven, or two and five are all EVGPs. So I'll show you how to configure EVGP and how you configure IVGP. Everybody following along? AS1000 is your transit AS. All of them can be transit ASs actually. I'm just showing you my, my AS is 1000, so I'm gonna work on this AS more. Even in this particular scenario, 400 is in a transit AS, 600 is a transit AS, but I'm not focusing on it. How come, how is AS400 a transit AS? Potentially, I can have traffic route to 1000 to 400, 400 to 700. That makes this a transit AS. Similarly, you can make 700 a transit AS. I can send the traffic from one to seven, seven to six. So he becomes a transit AS. Or for that matter, one to seven, seven to four, that's a transit AS. In this diagram, the only one that's non-transit is 500. That is correct. Clear everybody. All right, so let's do that. Let's start by setting up EVGP. EVGP is gonna be set up between what? What are the different devices that I'm gonna set up EVGP between? R2 to R5. Let's color these with a certain color that we're gonna indicate as EVGP. Let's use red. So this is EVGP. This is gonna be EVGP. E, E, over here, over here, and over here. Now within my autonomous system, I'm gonna be running what? IVGP. So these potentially are gonna be my IBGP neighbor relationships. Actually, I'm not gonna run it between one and three for a purpose. I'll show you, I'll tell you what that purpose is in a bit. But this, these are the relationships I'm gonna set up. Good so far, guys? So let's get started with two to five. How do I set up BGP? And what are the different things about advertising routes in BGP? So now I'm going to focus on eBGP over here. The way I run BGP is router BGP and the AS number. So if I'm sitting on R5, I'm going to say router BGP. 500 because my setup is for 500. Clear? <clears throat> Oops, wrong place right here. Now, my net, now I need to advertise a particular network in BGP. This is where I want you guys to be aware of something. This is my autonomous system. Yes, it does, and you also need to understand what it does. Let's say this is R5. Although I'm just showing you one route, you need to understand there's a big autonomous system, AS500 over here. 
it would be running some type of internal protocol over here. Let's say it's the edge RP, hypothetically speaking. R5 would also be running what? The edge RP, so it receives all the routes. Where are the routes at? They're in my routing table. Agreed? I have reachability to them. I learn all these routes through some type of routing protocol. In our case, it's going to be D4 EIGRP. In an IGP, when I use the network statement, what's the purpose of the network statement? We talked about that on day one. What does a network statement do in IGP? Enable the protocol on the interface. And then that would advertise that interface network to somebody else. So can I put a network statement for a network that does not exist on my router? Can I use a network statement in an IGP with a network that does not exist on my router? The answer is no. Why it needs, as you, you guys correctly said, it is used to enable a protocol on an interface. That means that interface has that network address. Right? That's the purpose in IGP. In BGP, that is not its purpose. BGP, the network statement, is to actually advertise it. Advertise the network to whom? to other BGP speakers or peers. You get my point? As long as the route is in my routing table, as long as the route, because I represent the entire AS, as long as the route is in my routing table, I have the ability to use the network statement to advertise it. So what's the requirement of the route or from the perspective of the network statement in BGP, it needs to be present in the routing table. That means the route is there. I'm advertising route in BGP so it can be propagated to the other autonomous systems. Do you understand that? Over there, it was to enable the interface so I could send and receive updates. I would enable my routing protocol, neighbor relationship, that type of stuff. Here, my purpose is specifically to advertise. So as long as the route is in my routing table, I will advertise the route. I use, I can use the network statement to do that. As long as it's in your routing table. You get my point. So whether it's directly connected, static route, uh, using a dynamic routing protocol, irrelevant. Because my purpose is that route is in my routing table, that route means is in my AS, I can advertise it. Understood that for the network statement? So it is different than what? Well, you don't use the word private. Internal would be better. Private can use it, have the connotation that you use the RSC 1918 address. Internal, right, Rick? So I understand what you mean. That's one. The other thing that you need to understand are the limitations of the network statement. What are the limitations of the network statement? The limitation of the network statement is it, when you advertise the network statement, you need to specify the exact network in your routing table. Exact. An exact map. For example, if I had internally, let's say 100.1.1.0, slash 24, 100.1.2.0 slash 24, 100.1.3.0 slash 24, and so on. My network statement cannot be this. This is not a wildcard map. This is an actual map.
Forget about supernets. You cannot even do subnets. These are all subnets. Dexter, could you uh, mute, please? Uh, do you mind right-clicking Dexter's name, uh, Kwar, and just uh, yeah. muting him? Okay, one second. Find him. Yep, he's on a control. Is there a mute all or no? Yeah, when you're not, if you go up to the top when you're uh, not uh, not sharing, or at least uh, it, you can go to audio um, and uh, or participant and mute all. Participant and mute. All. A participant doesn't do it. Yet. Should it be since you're the host? Um, I'll send you a screenshot. It it shows it in uh, mine, but I, since I'm no longer the host, I can't do it. That's okay. So. Coming back over here, so if I had 100 zero zeros mass 25500, what this is doing, it's looking for a network 100 with a mask of 25500. And in reality, I didn't even need to do that because 100 zero zero zero, if I put the network statement like that, automatically, if I don't put the mask over here, assumes the mask of 25500. Why? Because it is a Class A network with a mask of 255000, the default mask. So if I want to advertise these networks over here, I would need to do what? Network 100110 mask individually. You get my point. And then 100120 individually. If it was a major network, let's say it was 192.1.100.0, let's say, then I just could do this. If I don't put the mask in, it assumes the default mask. What's the default mask for this? Slash 24, so I wouldn't need to do that. So this is good enough. Do you get my point? But the thing is, don't assume that the mask is a... It's, uh, it's not a wildcard mask, it's a subnet. So let's do that real quick over here to in, in, inject these routes into BGP. We'll do this on R5. Right now on R5, I have 192.1.25.5. That's the external link towards my uh, other AS, which is AS1000. And if you take a look at blueback zero, it is I555 with the default mask. So that's five. And I'll create some subnets over here. I'll say loopback 101, 101.1.1, 255.255.255.0. Is this a major network? Is this, is this a subnet? I created four subnets. All right, now all these I want to enable in BGP. I want them to be injected into BGP. So once I pair up R5 with R2, these routes get advertised to the other BGP peer. How do I go about doing that? Router BGP 500, that's my autonomous system. Network 5000, and I'll press enter, why? The network five has a default mask, which is slash eight. So I don't need to put the mask in. But for the other ones, I do need to do what? This is not a wildcard mask, so I need to individually put the mask in. You get my point? Now, how do I verify that these routes are actually now in BGP or not? Once I put the network statement, I can check my BGP table. Remember, it's like your LSA database or it's like your EIGRP topology table. I can check that. 
you notice that these networks now are present in your BGP table. They would not be if they were not matched in your routing table. And you'll notice that you see that five without the mask because it's using the default mask. And this is slash 24 because it's non-default mask. Everybody okay with this? Now, the other thing that I also want you guys to see over here is this can be cumbersome. If I have hundreds of routes, it can be cumbersome to do it like that. So the other way of doing it, I'll say no route or BGP, get rid of it. The other way of doing it, you can redistribute them. Well, if it was learned through a IGP, I would redistribute that IGP in into my BGP, whether it was RIA, PIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, or if it was connected, I would say redistribute connected. But by just doing redistribute connected by itself, tomorrow if I add a new network, it is also going to get redistributed in. So generally what you do is, you do a redistribute connected, but you control it. How? Let's take a look. What I'll do is I'll create an ACL over here. In that ACL or a prefix list, it doesn't matter. I'm going to say one permit 101.1.0.0.0.0.255255. When I say this in an ACL, what does that mean? That means any network that has 101.1 in the first two octets is selected. All right? I'll call this inside a route map. I'll call this route map RC, redistribute connected, just a name. You can call it whatever you want. Match IP address 1. So RC is calling ACL1. Good so far? Now I can go into BGP and I'll put the network for five because that's simple. But all one of uh, the other ones, the 101 networks, I'll say redistribute connected because in, in my case over here, these are connected routes. If they, in your case they were learned through what? Another IGP, you would say redistribute BG, uh, sorry, OSPF or PIGRP and so on. But then you would qualify that with the route map RC saying, I do want to redistribute connected routes, but only the ones that are what? Specified in this route map called RC. And what does RC point to? It points to an ACL called one. This is, no, this is okay. This way you can get the multiple routes into your BGP table. Good so far? Can we check? Five is there and the 101s are there. But there's one thing that you need to pay attention to over here, also in BGP, is that you will see that if you look at the path, it says I, and you see a question mark over here for the other ones. By the way, this is not under the path. This is a bad uh, design, badly designed show command. The actual thing over here after the path, there's a column called the origin code. So in reality, when you see I under the path, that means the path is blank. The path being blank means it is a local route, route from my own, uh, what do you call it? From my own uh, AS. The origin code is, it, you need to in your mind do it like that. So the origin code is not over here, it's really over here. So the AS path right now is blank. So this column is origin code. Now what is the origin code? You see, if you look at your legend over here, you see that you have an origin code of I for IGP, E for EGP, and question mark for incomplete. EGP is the one that you'll never see. It's that older protocol that I remember of at the offset, I talked about EGP being a protocol that was uh, the, the other type of protocol that you could have for your uh, in competition with BGP. I don't have that anymore. But at the same time, I do have two other, uh, what do you call it, origin codes that I need to work with. One is IGP and the other one is incomplete. Did you mean B EGP? EGP is the protocol. 
EGP, is on the, at the offset, I said there's a category called EGP. Under EGP, there was a protocol called EGP and BGP. This one is not or is no longer implemented. That's what I meant for the EGP. So you're not going to have that. Okay, so I do have the two. What are the two that you have? One is called IGP, and the other one is called incomplete. What is the what is the difference between the two, and why why am I uh, concerned about that? One of the ways that you can select the best path. If you have two routes that are identical and you want to make a tiebreaker between them, one of the tiebreakers or selection criteria is the origin code, and it's pretty high. I'll get, I'll get to incomplete in a second. So IGP is preferred over a question mark. Does that make sense, guys? So over here, when you take a look at this, you have an I and you have a question mark. What is I? I is whenever you inject a route into BGP using the network statement. Whenever you redistribute the routes, they show up as a question mark. Incomplete. I don't know where they came from. You guys get my point. So the disadvantage of doing the redistribute over here was that I ended up having these routes with a non-preferred attribute. Make sense, guys? Everybody okay with this? So you want to prefer the I, but you also want to use the redistribute command because it helped me a lot. I, rather than writing a whole bunch of different network commands, I could accomplish the same in a single ACL, right? So one of the things that you can also do in your route map, if you wanted to, is you have the ability, you have the ability to uh, set the origin code under the route map to IGP. So you are basically telling the route man, hey, I know I'm doing a redistribute connected, but I want these routes to show up in your routing table as a IGP route. So it can be compared to the other protocols. Let me show you how. So if you look at your route map right now, you will notice this is my route map RC. Permit 10 is like a sequence number, and it says match IP address. In there, I'm also going to set another command, set origin as IGP, and that's the only thing that you can really do. All right? Incomplete is automatic, but I can also do IGP. You guys get my point. So when I do this, I need to do a reset, show IP BGP, and now you'll see the routes, although they're redistributed, are still showing up as IGP. You got my point. So this way, you have the ability to inject a bunch of different routes into your BGP table and still maintain the IGP over there. Otherwise, if you don't do that and you want the IGP to be maintained as the origin code, it is a bunch of different network statements after that, at that point. Okay? So this, these are the different ways of getting the route into your... Uh, routing table. So what are the different ways I did it? I'll do the ACL as well as the other mechanism over here. Access dash list one permit 101.1.0.0. Route dash map RC. Match IP address. One. Set origin as IGP. And here I said network 5000 and redistribute connected route dash map, what did I call it, RC. So this is how you get the route into your route, uh, BGP table. Now once it's in the BGP table, it's ready to be propagated to whom? To other routers that are BGP speakers or BGP peers. Good so far? All right, now let's move on to the BGP neighbor relationship itself. BGP neighbor relationship is not discovered, it's specified. You need to understand that. This is not a discovery process. I'm connecting my company 
to another company, my AS to another AS. I need to know the IP address of the guy. He will call me up. We'll probably have an external link that connects between the two autonomous systems. This is known as the external link. Uh, the external link is not your link. The external link is not his link. It is a common link that is used to connect the two different companies to each other, two different autonomous systems to each other. Generally, it's done in a place known as the network access point, NAPS. There are different IAI. IHP is another one where all the different ISPs put their routers in and connect them to each other. All right? So I don't own that. You don't own it. It's an external network just, just to connect two different ASs to each other. Okay, guys, everybody okay with this? R2 will do the same thing. Let's do the same thing on R2. Let's put the routes into BGP on R2. What do I have on R2 that I need to do? Show IP interface brief. These are my physical links. I'm not going to set them in a BGP. This is my physical link. I'm not going to do that in BGP. Loopback 0, I'm going to advertise it. Loopback 10 is a 10 network. It's a private network. There's a different purpose for that. I'll explain that later on. So over here, I'm going to say show IP uh, route into C. It'll show me that 2 has a mask of what? 8. So if I want to advertise it, Router BGP 1000, the RAS is 1000 for router 2, based on this topology that I have over here. Good. And then network statement 2000. As soon as I do that, I should see the 2 route in my BGP table. Good so far. So all the routes are on router 2 and router 5. Now I'm ready to set up the neighbor relationship. The link between 2 and 5 is 192.1.25.0. So what do I need to do over here? Neighbor, 192.1.25.5, remote AS is 500. The command, neighbor, the destination neighbor, the keyword remote AS followed by the actual AS number. Now, whether I want to run IGP or IBGP or EBGP depends on this. So if I do a section router, you will notice that in BGP, you have the network statement and then the neighbor statement. My neighbor statement has a remote AS of 500. My own AS is what? 1000. So what do I run over here? If the remote AS is different than my AS, what form of BGP am I running? E or I? I'm running eBGP with my neighbor. Good so far? So that's how the router knows to run E or I. There's no router eBGP or router iBGP. Just based on the different autonomous systems between the local versus the remote, I'm going to run E. If it's the same, it's going to be I. What do I do on 5? Router BGP 500. Neighbor 25.2. Remote AS is 1000. Clear, guys? Now, some show commands over here. I showed you the first command, show IP BGP, to show you your, what do you call it? The BGP table. If I do a show BGP summary, it'll tell me my neighbors. My neighbor that is there that I've configured is 25.2. It's running BGP version 4. AS number is 1000, the, the AS number that he's running in. Numbers, number of messages sent and received, these are internal numbers, don't worry about that. Up for 21 seconds, that tells me it's up. And the state, prefixes received. If you see a number over here, even if it's zero, that is an indication that your BGP neighbor relationship is up. This just tells you how many routes were exchanged. The other ones that you generally see are idle. Idle means I've configured it, but I can't see the neighbor. Or active means I've configured it. I'm trying to establish a neighbor relationship. I'm looking for the neighbor. Okay. Idle means I don't have a route to it. Active will look for a route. So that tells you that my IPBGP neighbor uh, summary tells you all, all your neighbors and their statuses. Now, if you want to see the routes that are received, show IPBGP. Now you'll see that I've received what? Network 2 from where? 
25.2. And notice the AS path now has what? 1,000. Because this graph was received from where? From what AS? It was received from? It was received from? A, uh, AS1000, which is R2. So the AS path was prepended. Good so far? And if I go to router 2, I should also see the same DGP routes, and the AS path is attached to them. 5, 101, 101.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, all of them are there. And once they're there, if they're the best route, in my case, there's only one route. So show IP route BGP will be over here. The 0000 is a route that is directly connected to me. Now, local has two meanings. Local can be local to the AS or local can be the local to the router. 0000, next stop means it's local to the router. Okay. Local to the AS, how do I know a route is local to the AS, which is a good question to ask, is by looking at your AS path. If the AS path is blank, how do I know it's blank? If the AS path just has what? I over here, that means it's what? From my AS. So it's local to the AS. 0000, zero, zero, zero is an indication it's local to the router. Again, that is a, it's not part of the, I is the origin code, but because it's indented all the way to the left, that means there's no AS path. All right, so we've done the EBGP in a relationship set up from where to where, from R5 to R2. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for, from where to where now. R1 to R4, R1 to R7, R4 to R7, 3 to 7, 3 to 6, 6 to 7. I'll just go through it. Tell me if you don't understand it. If you don't understand something that I'm doing, let me know, but I'm going to go a little faster over here. So you guys, we can move on to IGP next. But I'm not going to do anything different over here. So one EBGP enable relationship is set up. On R1, I'm going to have two. One towards four, one towards seven. One is going to be 14.4. The other one is going to be 17.7. 14.4 is going to be in 100. 17.7 .7 is going to be in 700. I'm going to do it over here. So this thing, I need to do, complete this. So R5, I also needed to put the neighbor command. 25.2, remote AS was 1,000. On R2, it was simple. I just had one network statement and a neighbor towards 25.5, remote AS is 500. All right? This is the relationship between what? E, BGP between R2 and R5. Okay, now the next thing is EBGP between, I'll do it per router on R1. Let's check the routes over here on R1 and then we'll put the neighbor statements accordingly. Router 1. Actually, I should do this. Show, because I need the maps. Show IP route include C. The 192 networks are all my physical networks. I'm not going to advertise 10.1, which is a private network. But then 1.0, I'm going to advertise. So I only have one network over here. Router BGP 1000. Network 1.0.0.0. I have two neighbors. 14.4. Remote AS is 400. Neighbor is 17.7. .7. Remote AS is 700. This is going to be on R1. Let's set it up. So one is done. Now let's do four. Four has two neighbors, 14.1 and 14.47.7. I'm going to advertise the network that I have over there. Let's find out what network do I have. Try IP route, include connected with a slash H mask. So I'm going to copy this. Network is 4. I'm in 400. 14.1 is one of my neighbors. It's in AS1000. 
47.7 as my other neighbor is in 700. So at this point, I would have a neighbor relationship between four and one because one I had configured already. Now I'm configuring four. Try IP route or try IP BGP. You know the neighbor relationship just came up and the four route is there and eventually one will come up as well. So while it's doing its thing, I'll do seven next. Now seven has a bunch of different neighbors. Let's take a look. Seven has four EGP links and I forgot one of them. This guy over here is also EBGP. All right, save as, we need to save it over here in your folder. It is called BGP. All right, so seven will have one neighbor relationship towards four, 47.4 in AS400. 17.1 in 1000, 37.3 in 1000, 67.6 6 in 600. So four neighbors. I need to find out what his, I need to get it first, the interfaces. These are all physical seven slash eight. So this is good. Let's go over here and test set it on seven will be 700. Yep, the seven, 14, I don't have, I have 17. Got one, this is good, 47.4 and 400. Let's copy this. Thirty-seven three in AS1000 and I have 600 which is 67.6, copy, I should have two neighbors come up, one and four, there you go, one and four are up, how do I know they're up, they got numbers against them. Good so far? Almost done. Let's go to three now. Three has two neighbors. One is 37.7 in 700, 36.6 uh, 36 in 600. So again, let's copy paste some. I did six first, so six is 30. 6.3 is my neighbor in 1000 and 67.7 is in 700. So I can just copy this on 6 and I believe I'm pretty sure it has 6. Yeah. One neighbor should come up, which is 7. Both are idle. Give it some time. neighbor came up, three routes pop populated. And take a look at the routes. Let's just take a look at those routes and you'll see the big AS now. I'm seeing network one propagated from where? 700, which got it from 1000. I also see four from 700 who got it from 400. You guys understand that's how the AS path gets built. And the last router over here is router three, and my EVGP neighbor relationships are done. Thirty-six dot set, thirty-seven dot seven is seven hundred, and this is six hundred, which is should have kept that thirty-six dot six. It's not 300, sorry, it is 1,000. Copy, go to router three, make 
sure I have read and then paste it. Let the neighbors come up and you'll see a whole bunch of different routes. There you go. Questions, guys? Everybody okay with this? So that is eBGP for you. So this is connecting the different autonomous systems to each other. Now, remember that thing that I told you about in terms of propagating the route from one side to the other? My objective now is to connect this domain over here, this autonomous system over here, 500, with the ones on the bottom. R2 has the routes, which is part of AS1000. He needs to send those routes to whom? Router 1. So Router 1, once he gets them, he can propagate the routes over here. I could do redistribution of it by running a routing protocol locally. Okay? Or I, if I want to maintain my attributes, that's where IBGP comes in. Understood? So that's what I want to do now is I want to set up the neighbor relationship between two and one in an IGP using IGP. Why do I want to do that? I want to take the routes that I received from five on two. Two should propagate the routes to one. One should propagate the routes to seven and four, but maintain my BGP attributes. So how do I set up IBGP over here? The way I set up IBGP, I could have done the normal neighbor command over here. And I'll show you the characteristics as we go along. When I do it, I could have done based on the neighbor relationship over here. But within my internal domain, within my AS1000, what did I tell you I have normally? I have some form of an IGP. Normally, also within your domain, within your own autonomous system, you have redundancy. You, do you see that I have three different paths over here? I have multiple ways from getting from R2 to R1. Correct? R2 to R1, I can take the direct path or I can take the scenic route from R3 to R1. Agreed? Now, when I set up my neighbor relationship, I could do it based on the physical IP of this neighbor. But if I do that and this link is lost, although I still have reachability to where? To R1, the neighbor relationship will be down. So rather than doing that, you should do it in such a way that even if an interface goes down, I still maintain a relationship as long as I do it with a type of an interface that does not go down. What type of interface does not go down? Loopback. So I'll create a loopback over here, create a loopback over here, but now R2 needs to have reachability to what? The loopback on this guy. So that they can form a neighbor relationship. All right? Understood? So once I create the loopback, what's the purpose of this loopback over here? Its loopback is to allow router one and router two to talk to each other based on that interface that does not physically go down. So even if I lose the physical link, I still have reachability to it to my IGP. So my IGP will provide me reachability to the loopback based on which I'm going to set up my IBGP neighbor relationships. Understood? So what I've done over here is that's the purpose of creating that loopback what? 10.2.2.0 and 10.1.1.0 on the two devices. These are the loopback 10. I've created them already. Not only did I create them, I also took the liberty of running EIGRP as my IGP and exchanging these routes with each other. So I have loopback 10.3.3.0, 10.2.2.0, 10.1.1.0, and I've advertised that in your IGP. So to set up 
your uh, what do you call it uh, IGP so this is done configuring IBGP not IGP IBGP step one create a loopback interface on the BGP router so R1 I did what interface loopback 10 IP address 10.1.1.1 and I will say advertise this loopback under an IGP to provide reachability to the loopback the IBGP neighbor relationship will be set based on these loopbacks so that even if the physical interface goes down the I BGP neighbor relationship relationship stays up. All right, so that's what I'm doing over here. So what I did was I EIGRP 100, no auto, network 192.12.0. That's the physical link. Now I'm running my IGP over here 23.0. Network is 10. On R2, did a similar type of thing. So you guys have the notes for that as well. So I'm just putting it over here, although I'm done with that. I have 12. All right, this is 13, though. 12, 23, and 10. This is good. And I have R3. Thirteen and twenty-three and hundred. So I can show you that over here. I've done that. Show run. Yeah. The pur only purpose of these uh, loopbacks is just to establish the neighbor relationship. I set them as private because I'm not going to advertise them in outside my AS. So show run router EIGRP. I am I'm running that over here. Not only that, if I do show IP route. EIGRP, you will notice that I have reachability to 10.1 and 10. Good. Once this is established, now I can set up my BGP, IBGP neighbor relationship. Configure the IBGP neighbor relationship based on the loopback. When I say it needs to be done based on the loopbacks or should be done based on the loopbacks, you need to understand one thing. It needs to be done as loopback, not only as a destination, but also as a source. Let me go through that real quick. I have router one over here. I have router two over here. I'm going to establish a neighbor relationship between R1 and R2. So over here on R1, I'll say router BGP 1000 neighbor. 10.2.2.2 remote AS is 1000. As soon as you see that both the ASs are the same, it knows it needs to run IBGP. Agreed so far? And this interface is 12.0. This is dot one, this is dot two. Now what does this do? It says, oh, I need to set up a BGP neighbor relationship with 10.2.2.2, it checks its local routing table, says 10.2.2.2 is reachable via 192.12.2, so I need to send the packet there. But in my layer 3 header, what is the source and destination packet of that? What is the IPv4 source and destination? The destination, because my neighbor is 10.2.2.2, is this. What's the source? It's going to be the outgoing interface. When I send the update to him, what's his neighbor going to be? His neighbor is going to be what? It's going to do a neighbor scan. 
And in there, he's going to see that he does not have a neighbor, 192, called that one. He has a neighbor called 10 da one da one da one. But there's no neighbor here for this guy. He will discard that. Because the neighbor packet came in with a source that does not match any of the neighbors over here. Do you understand that? So not only do I need to do, hey, listen, this is my destination, but I also need to tell it my loop, my source is my loopback. You know how you do a ping, source based ping? Same thing over here. So I need to say, whenever I communicate to 10.2.2.2 for the neighbor, use my update source as loopback 10. So now when it creates a packet, it's going to be 10.1.1.1. 10.2.2. Clear so far? So let's do that. Let's do it between R1 and R2 to establish that neighbor relationship. So how do I do it? Router TCP 1000, neighbor 10.2.2.2, remote AS is 1000, neighbor 10.2.2.2. Update source, loop back 10. This was on R1. What do I do on R2? Same thing, just point to what? Copy, go to one. Set it, copy, go to two, set it. You guys, somebody's mic is on. Alex? Okay, I muted him. All right, let's quieten down. Okay. So my neighbor relationship is up. Under participants, where is it under participants? see it yeah from I pulled it up but I can't see the mute thing okay it doesn't see it maybe maybe during the break you show me all right so my neighbor relationship came up take a look do you see that Good, so I should have some routes over here. So if my neighbor relationship is up between these two guys, R5 send me a BGP route, five. I'll take that route and send it to R1 because now I have an IBGP neighbor relationship and it will maintain the AS path. Agree? Let's check. No, it's there. Trust me, it's there. All right, so five came in into router two. Router two has an IBGP neighbor relationship. It sent it to R1. Good so far? But one of the things that IBGP does, because it's, what was the purpose of IBGP. Why did I have IBGP? To get the route from one edge to the other edge, right?
so that I maintain what? The BGP attribute. Maintaining the attributes or keeping the attributes. Now, one of the BGP attributes that IBGP maintains is known as this attribute known as a next top address. It's an attribute. Generally speaking, if A sends a route to B as a routing, uh, routing protocol, what's the route's next hop? Normally on B. It's going to be A, right? Correct? You guys follow along? B sends it to C, same network X. What's the next stop on C? B, which is normal. EBGP also works like that. Let me show you that. If you look at this diagram, R4 is sent to whom? Network 4 is sent to 7 from where? R4. So on R7, the next stop for 4 will be 47.4. Let's check. Try P route BGP. To get to 4, I'm 4. Sorry, I'm on 4. Try P route BGP. To get to 4, the next stop is 47.4, which is fine because I got it from 4. When 7, in turn, sends it to 6, what should the next stop be on 6? Help me out. Come on. 7, right? Normal. Agreed? But over here, we talked about IBGP being a routing protocol that just propagates the routes from one edge to the other edge without losing any of the attributes. Well, next stop is an attribute. So when R5 send the route to R2, this is EBGP. So for five, the next stop is going to be what? Everybody agree with that? Yeah? When two sends it to one, it's I B G P. That means it will just take the route as is and send it across. So when R one gets it, he will get it as five. Next stop will still be. I don't change any of the attributes. It'll still be twenty five dot five. Does R one know how to get to twenty five dot five? This is the external link over here, right? This link is not advertised within my autonomous system. This is, does not belong to me. So what happens on R1 now? Take a look. On R1, I do receive the route in my BGP table. You do see the route over there, okay? But if you look closely, couple of things have happened. Number one, the next stop is still pointed to five. And because I don't know how to get to five, it does not put it into my routing table. If you notice right next to five, there's a star followed by, on some of the routes they have the greater than sign. This one is missing that greater than sign. The greater than sign means it's the best route. I'm gonna put it into my routing table. If it does not know how to reach the next stop, it does not put it into the routing table. It remains in your BGP table. So if I went ahead and did my show IP route BGP, five will not be in my BGP table. Do you guys understand that? Why? the next stop is not reachable. Now you have two alternatives over here. Now one of, the, one of the alternatives is that you actually advertise the external link over here so router one knows 25.5 can be reachable via R2. 
That's one option. The other option is, which is the BGP option, is to, no, not real router vector. The BGP option is to tell router two when it propagates the route from R2 towards R1, change the next stop. The default is not to change it, but I do want to change it. Change it to what? To itself. And rather than changing it to the IP address of the interface, change it to the, uh, the neighbor address that we have, which is the loopback address. So just in case I lose the middle link, I can still reach it. But I need to do that manually. By default, BGP, IBGP does not change the next stop. I'll write that down. Note, BGP, IBGP does not change the next stop attribute by default. This causes the route from an I, so from an EBGP neighbor to be propagated towards an IBGP neighbor, but the next hop will remain as the external link, which is not visible inside the air. Understood? To get around this problem, you configure your IBGP neighbors such that they do change the next of attributes to themselves. If you don't, you're going to get the route in the other routing table, but it's not going to. One is to advertise that link. This link that you have, the external link, you actually put, put that as a network statement or redistribute that into your IGP. No, no, that's, I'm, you're going on to a route reflector. We haven't talked, the route reflector is not over here right now. I'm getting this route from R5 to 2, 2 to 1. There's no route reflector option over here, no full mesh. I want this, the problem over here. What's the problem? Understand the problem over here. What's the problem over here? R1 does not know how to get to 25.5. So I have two options. Either actually inject that 25.5 into my routing table so he knows how to get there. Okay, or change the next stop so the next stop points to R2. I know how to get there. Two options. Okay, so I'm going to use the one that's most commonly used, which is neighbor. Whatever route that I send towards him, change the next stop to cell. And then you should clear the BGP table doing clear IP BGP star soft. Soft means don't reset the entire neighbor relationship, which will call a dis uh, cause a disruption. Just update it. Any update, send it across. So now if I go to five, not five, sorry, R1, you will notice that five, first of all, you'll see that there is a greater than sign against it. And the next top attribute is set to 10.2.2.2. So now I know how to get to 10.2.2.2. That's why it becomes the best route. Because it's the best route, you should expect it to be seen and where? In your BGP table. But the thing is, I haven't done it the other way around. So four would be propagated to what? One with the next stop or what? Fourteen dot four. Oh yeah, you guys are sending a thanks. Uh, uh, Katie, yeah, they're sending it as uh, what do you call a private message? I totally forgot. Send it to everyone. When R1 sends it to R2, 
I'm still, uh, what do you call it? I'm still sending it with what? Without the next stop. So he will still get it as 4000 slash 8. Next stop as 192, 1.14.1. Okay. So let me see it and then I'll fix it. So if I go over here to router 2, the 4 network, the 7 network, all those networks will be in my BGP table. So the next stop will be 14.4. 7 will be there, 6 will be there, the 17.7. You get my point. So I need to go to router 1 and do the same thing that I did for what? 2 towards 1, I need to do it from 1 towards 2 as well. Next stop, self, clear, IP, BGP, dot soft, which resets the table, so it's faster to converge. Now if I go back over here, everything is good because I'm pointing to the next stop over here. So whenever you're doing it, you should always do a next stop self over here. So how do I do it? R1, I'll just do the full, full sample, full, uh, sorry, full config. R1, I just wanted you to see what happens if you don't do it. And neighbor 10.2.2.2, next top cell. Copy. This will be all one. Good guys, everybody okay with this? So now, if you take a look at four, I should have five routes. Five should have, have four's route. Take a look. Try P, BGP, IC5, IC5 from two places. I see it from where? 14.1, which is R1, and 7, because 1 sent to 7, 7 sent it to 4 as well. But I'm fixing the route direct, which is through 14.1. 1,500 is your, uh, what do you call it? The AS path, shorter AS path. This is a longer AS path, so it's fix the shorter AS path. If I do a trace route over here on R4, Trace to 5.5.5.5 .5 .5 .5 .5 .5 .5 .5 .5 from 4.4.4.4. I'm going to 1, to 2, to 5. My thing is working. My trace route is working. So now I have established what? This to this, this to this, and this to this. Good. Let's do the same thing from R2 to R3, R3 to R6. This one we haven't done. So let's do that on R2 now. How do I do it? Now that you guys know how to set this up, I'll do it real quick. R2, I need to set up a neighbor towards 10.3. Remote AS is 1,000. Neighbor 10.3, update sources loop back 10. Neighbor 10.3, next stop cell. So whenever I'm pointing towards an IBGP neighbor, these three commands would be your default commands. And on three, neighbor 10.2.2.2, remote AS is 1,000. Loop back. And then I have my next stop. So, clear IP, BGP, matrix off. I should see the five out. Everybody okay with this? So if you take a look at what we need to do, where are we at right now? Purpose of BGP covered, eBGP covered, iBGP redundancy, which is a loopback, next stop attribute covered. Let's do authentication. We'll take a break, come back and do route reflector after the break. Authentication is very simple. BGP only supports one type of authentication, which is MD5. It's neighbor-based. So for example, if I want to authenticate, let's say R2 to R5, the way I would do it is like this.
authentication. BG support, BGP supports MD5 authentication only. It is done on a per neighbor basis. So how do I do it? Let's do a router two to router five. Router BGP one five hundred. Router two is one thousand. Neighbor twenty five dot five. Remote AS. Oh, we've done the remote AS. Sorry. All I got to do is set the password. I set the password. It assumes and it only supports what MD five. So over here I would do router BGP five hundred. Neighbor twenty five dot two. Password is Cisco one two. Let's do five first. Done. Let's do this first, second now. Good. Supports MD5 authentication only. It is done on a per neighbor. Done. So and you can do the same thing on all the other routers. Let's do another, let's do an IGP as well, based on this, and then we'll take a break. So on R2, neighbor 10.1.1.1, password, same way. Let's do CCA123. And on R1, I would do neighbor 10.2.2.2. Password is CCA123. Simple enough, it's not that tough. One of the easier authentications to do. Good, so let's save this as day five. Okay. Let's take a short break, 10 minutes. Uh, make it 15, it's okay. Caught up a lot. When we come back after the break, it is 11.10 right now, reference clock. Take it till 11.25. When we come back in 15 minutes, we will take a look at BGP route reflectors. Very, very important topic. This is the core of BGP, the route reflector. We'll set that up and we shall be done with BGP. Right after that, we'll get into MTLS Unicast Router. Good? Everybody okay with this? All right, good, good. Hey guys, where is that participant thing? Because I can't see it. So when I go to participant on the top, it shows me all the different participants. In the menu bar, I am on the menu bar. There's a participant over there, audio. Oh, okay. So you'll have to stop sharing for a second or hit go back. Um, okay. And then you'll get the full bar across the top that says participant. All right. Okay. I see it now. Now when you... That way you now have a, have a little more control. You muted me in the middle of that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because when I went up there, because I had the sharing, the participant didn't give me that option. Yeah, it trims down when you're sharing the screen. So uh, no worries. Yeah. But yeah, that's essentially what you, what you would uh, use. Um, but yeah, and you can also go up there and have the chat off to the side. I don't know if you've already done that already and the participants off to the side as well. So if somebody does come and unmute. Yeah, the chat I keep on the on the right so I can see it. Today at least the chats, the reason I didn't want to do WebEx is because the chats the other day were coming in point two or something like that. I couldn't even read what they were saying. I had to go right next to the computer to look at it. So today I did the 
I did the chat a little di or the WebEx a little different. I used the uh, WebEx Training Center, which is is designed obviously. You can see a little bit di uh, different interface and everything. That was mostly so mute on entry, have a registration and stuff like that. But uh, oh. be beyond that, um, uh, we didn't really need that today. So this yeah, is the on the fly regular WebEx. Yep. All right, I'm going back on mute. See you guys later. Uh, I'll take a break as well.
What's up, guys? You guys back? Yes, sir, please. No, man, not yet. Waiting for it. So you guys are okay with the, the stuff? <laughs> Napping over <laughs> So you guys are okay with the BGP stuff that we've covered so far? Now the next thing I need to take a look at is another issue that you have with BGP and that is called BGP split horizon. What does BGP split horizon do? It basically states if I learn a route from an IBGP neighbor, I'm not going to send it to another IBGP neighbor. So, for example, right now, I have network 101 over here, not 101, sorry, 1000 slash 8. I've sent it to R1, R2, R2 has propagated to R5. I've sent one zero over here, I've sent one uh, zero over here. Seven has propagated one to him. Can seven send that route to three? Don't forget, three is also NAS, 1000. So when R3 receives the route, he's gonna say, hey, this is my own AS route. So he's going to discard it. But R2 received the route. Router 2 has a neighbor relationship with R3. Does R2 send the route to 3? That answer is also no. The reason of that is split horizon. It's not your IP split horizon. It is BGP split horizon. Different rule. Okay? So let me write that down for you guys. The... Technology will take a look at is route reflection, but the rule in BGP routes learn from one IBGP neighbor cannot be sent to another IBGP neighbor. This is because of the BGP split horizon rule, which states routes from one IBGP neighbor cannot be sent to another I. Good so far? So how do I get around that? Now, there are different ways to get around that. There are two main ways to get around that. One of the ways to get around that is I set up, for example, over here, I have R1, I have R2, and R3. Right now, I set up an IBGP neighbor relationship over here. And I set up an IBGP neighbor relationship over here. And I thought that R1 would send it to 2, 2 should send it to 3, but because of BGP split horizon, that's not happening. So one of the ways I can do it is I can set up an IBGP neighbor relationship between R1 and R3 as well. So now I've established an IBGP neighbor relationship with each and every edge router, which is fine with three routers, but it has serious scalability issues in the sense that if I had a larger network, or a larger AS, which is generally the case with a service provider network, and I have multiple edges. It would be very hard to have a full mesh where every edge talks to every edge using because they're all be in the same autonomous system. It would be very hard for me to maintain full mesh neighbor relationship over here. You guys agree? But that is one of the options. 
That is one of the options that every router sets up a neighbor relationship with all the other IGP neighbors. The other alternative is to set up a router in the middle, which is known as a route reflector. Everybody sets up a neighbor relationship with a route reflector. He, in turn, is the one that is allowed to propagate the route to the other IBGP neighbors. The way you do it, you set up this as a route reflector server. The other guys are the clients. The BGP split horizon rule is overwritten when I receive a route from a client, I can send a route to another client. The, who's going to send that route across? It's the route reflector. So to come around the issue of what? BGP split horizon, you need to set up within your autonomous system a router, central router that will be connecting to all the edges, allowing the propagation of the routes from one edge to the other edge. Everybody okay with this? How do I set it up? I'll show you. Understand that though. Do you guys see any drawback with this? If I have this type of setup, is there a drawback that you see over here? Single point of failure? Okay, we'll set that out. I'll set up two route reflectors, RR1 and RR2, and set them up as neighbors with everybody. So I fixed that, I set up two RRs. How about the traffic? Because of this split horizon, now the traffic needs to go from where to where? To the route reflector to the other side, right? This becomes your bottleneck. Actually, they don't. Joseph, and I'll explain how and why. You guys understand that? So the way they design it is to avoid the bottleneck, but also get rid of the scalability issue that you have with full mesh. This is the way you should design your route reflector setup. So that it doesn't become too cluttery, I'll set up four routers, A, B, C, and D. These are my edges. You guys wanted redundancy, I'll set up two route reflectors, RR1 and RR2. All the edge routers will form a neighbor relationship with whom? the two RRs. Everybody okay with this so far? Now what happens in this, these orange boxes are external autonomous systems that they AS number one, two, three, and four. This is AS 1000. The way a route reflector works is when you send a route, to the edge, edge sends it to the route reflector. Route reflector reflects the route to C, C, and D without changing any of the attributes. Even if you have a next stop self, it would still not change the next stop self. Even if you have a next stop self set up on the RR, it is not going to change the next stop of a route reflector or of a client. So, what that basically means that when B, C, and D receive the route A, this guy one, the next stop will remain as A, not RR1 and RR2. Understood so far? Why? The RR does not change the next stop, does not. How is that an advantage? The advantage is now I can set up a fast-paced data network over here, where I set up all of them to connect up to it on the same network. The 
say this common network over here is 10.10.10.10.0. Let's say it's a fast nexus 5K with 40G or 10G type of interfaces, which are connected over here. My neighbor relationship will be to RR1 and RR2. They're responsible for doing my control plane and sending the route to B, C, and D. The next stop, though, will remain as A, which let's say is 10.10.10.1. Now, when B receives the packet that is that needs to go to one, it checks the next stop. The next stop is what? 10.1.1.1. Does it go through RR or does it go through the data network? So now the traffic goes to the nexus, not the RR. So the RR is there just for the purpose of propagating the, the routes, the control plane. The data plane is segregated and goes directly from spoke to spoke. So coming back to the question that Kevin said, so, so basically no spoke to spoke. Actually, you have spoke to spoke traffic, but the, the control plane is through the RR. Do you get my point? So there's not a lot of traffic or load on the RR except for control plane propagation. The actual data plane is segregated. That's the design that you want to have. Now, if you don't have this, yeah, obviously, now you are making RR act as your data plane as well, because the, the only way that B, C, and D are talking to each other is through the RR. Make sense, guys? So this is a design that you want to follow where you want to segregate your data plane for your from your control plane. Now I'm gonna not I'm not gonna do this big design over here for you guys, but at the same time I'll show you that segregation of control plane and data plane. But I want you guys to understand how this works. Any questions on this over here? This also is a design thing where you, when you go to buy your devices, now when you buy the route reflectors, you don't need to get the 40 gig interfaces on those. You can get a router that has a lot of memory, more CPU power, not necessarily speed. Whereas on the switches you can, or the, the devices on where your data plane is traveling over, that's where you focus your money to buy the faster interfaces. If you guys have questions about this, please let me know, and otherwise I'll just go in and figure it. Good, everybody? All right, so here on our diagram, how does it work? What I'm going to do over here is I'm going to make this into my route reflector. I already have a neighbor relationship over here between R1 and R2. I already have a neighbor relationship between two and three. That's how I get this route from three to two to five, five to two to one. But that does not allow R1 to go to R3 yet because I've not made this into a route reflector server. I've not made this into a client yet. Okay, once I make it into a client, let me show you what what's going to happen. Let's talk about it, then I'll show it to you. So I have network one over here. I'm going to propagate that route to two. What's the next stop going to be over here for one? It's my network. So router two is going to have 1.0.0.0 slash eight be the next stop or what? Come on, R1, good, clear? What did I tell you that R2 when he reflects the route towards R3? What does R3 show for 1.0.0.0 slash 8? What's the next stop? Remember what I told you, the route reflector does not change the next stop even if you have the next stop parameter set. 
So it will still show you the next stop as R1. Nope, I am running EHRP on all three links. So router three to get to router one does have a data plane that is direct. Let's choose a different color. Let's say green, this is your data plane. So my data plane is this way. So although the route got propagated via R2, my data plane will say what the best way I can get to R1, the best way to get to R1 is via the 13 network. So my data path is gonna be this. So I'm not using the RR to propagate any other traffic that I learned that is actually originating from R1. Does that make sense, guys? Let's do it. How do I make R2 into a route reflector? Very simple. I already have the name relationships on R2, which is my route reflector. Let's do a show run. I have the neighbor for what, 10.1 and neighbor for 10.3. You guys see that? All I gotta do is say router BGP 1000 neighbor 10.1.1.1 is a client for route reflection. IBGP, uh, there's no IBGP pairing between R1 and R2. If I do, then it becomes full mesh, I will send the route direct. So right now I'm going to do it to what? to the route reflector, the router in the middle. Good, I'll show you that, that they don't have any neighbor relationship among between each other. So IP BGP summary, my neighbors on R1, R2, four and seven. Right, on R3, show IP BGP summary, my neighbors are two, six and seven. But when I look at my routing table now, I'll see one. One has what? Next stop set to 10.1.1.1. Hmm. If I check my routing table, how do I reach 10.1.1.1? My EHRP is telling me that 10.1.1.1 is reachable via 13.1, which is 13.1. So look at your topology, 13 is a direct link over here. So I've segregated my data plane and my control plane. My control plane is going via what? This guy. And my data plane is going this way. Understood? Can we verify that? Let's check. So if I'm sitting on R3, you know I don't have any name relationship with whom? R1, but if I do a trace route to 1.1.1.1 from 3.3.3.3, take a look, direct path. Or for that matter, show IP BGP, network four is reachable via what? 10.1.1 rather than 37.7 because it's an extra hop, right? Correct? So it's it's gone to one, one has sent it to two, two sent it to three, but it doesn't show two in the middle, it shows direct over here. So if I go on R3 and do a trace to what? 10.1. No, not 10 dot four dot four dot four dot four source of three 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 three. I'm going direct to one and one to four. No two. Everybody okay with this? That's the beauty of doing a route reflector if you do it properly. You don't you want to make sure you have data path that are directed, uh, directly connecting the edges to each other, that's where the nexus switch would come in, and you have your control plane done through a central router or a couple of routers for redundancy.
Good so far? And that is route reflection as well. Did I put that in over here? Nope. Router. So I'm going to do this on the device that is going to be the route reflector. So router BGP 1000. Neighbor 10.1.1.1. Route reflector server. Or sorry, client. Neighbor. 10.3.3.3, route reflector client. Good, everybody? Now, a sample config. One more thing I'll show you over here that is nice as well is the concept of peer groups. Now, remember that big, big old topology that I was talking about over here where everybody is connecting to us? The RR is connecting to multiple what? Edges. What's a common IBGP neighbor relationship that you set up? What are the commands over there? Router what? BGP 1000. In there, you would have neighbor. With the remote AS? No. What else do you do? Update source. Next top cell. These are common things, right? Maybe a password. Route reflector client, because I'm doing this on this. So how many commands? One, two, three, four, five commands? Basic one, the ones that you're generally going to do for each neighbor, right? How many of you guys have set your uh, messages to private? Change that to everyone. Okay. If I had 10 routers like that, And I have five commands each. How many lines would go under my router BGP statement? About 50. Because I have 10 neighbors. Each neighbor requires these five lines. Right? Rather than doing that, what you have the ability to do is you have the ability to create what is known as a peer group, which keeps a group uh, which keeps a group of commands that can be applied to neighbors. Let me do that on R2. Let's set up authentication over here as well on R3. So we, I think I did authentication between one and two. Show run section router BGP. Do I have a password? Yeah, let's just set the password on R3 as well. R2, neighbor. All right. Take a look at my router BGP statement just by looking at two neighbors. And each neighbor, how many commands do I have? One, two, three, four, five. And all the parameters are the same. Remote AS 1000, remote AS 1000, CCIE password, CCIE password, update source loopback 10, update source loopback 10, route reflector client, next top cell. Same command, right? So what I'm going to do over here is say no neighbor 10111 and 10333. Instead, this is what I'm going to do. Neighbor, I'm going to create a peer group by saying IG, IBGP or I don't want you guys to get confused. ABC, any name. This is how you create a peer group. ABC is a peer group. In this peer group ABC, the commands that I'll have are remote AS 
1000. ABC will also have another command called update source 2 back 10. It will have route reflector client. It will have password. And it'll have next stop cell. Good. How many commands now? Are those ten three? I have to get rid of no neighbor. So how many commands in the ABC peer group? Remote AS, CCIE updates uh, passwords, update source loop back and route reflector next stop cell. Now that I've done that. I don't have a neighbor 10.1 or 10.3. All I got to do is say neighbor 10, 111. It belongs to peer group I, ABC. What does that do? It assigns all the commands over here. And for 10.3. So this is what your config looks like now. This is your peer group, all the commands that are pertaining to the peer group. And I make 10.1 and 10.3 members of that peer group. The more a new client, new edge comes up, all I got to do is do what? Assign it to the peer group. Understood? I don't care about these, I just want to focus on the peer group. Only. Most of the commands that you guys will have will always have most of the implementation that you'll have is based is going to be based on the peer group rather than doing it manually. Oops, sorry. You guys there? Hello, hello. I see Kaplan's uh, screen. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, good. So that took care of this portion over here in terms of what we needed to cover. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is MPLS unicast routing. You guys ready? Okay, you asked for it. MPLS unicast routing, what is that? In order to understand that, let me uh, brief you or bring, uh, show you the progression of the technology as it worked through to get to what it is today. Initially, when we started, we had process switching. In process switching, every packet that went to the router was checked against the routing table before getting forwarded. Let me make sure everybody is on the same page regarding this. 
I have a very simple network. This is 10110 connect into R2. Let's say this is 10, 10, 10, 0, P01, P00, and I have 10, 2, 2, 0, slash 8 over here. This is P01 over here. Good so far? I have a PC down here which wants to communicate to this PC over here. PC1, PC, let's say two. One second, guys. Important stuff. I need fuel. You got to have your fuel, man. <laughs> All right. So let's analyze this. What's going on with this one? Oh. Okay. Let's take a look at this process and explain. No, it's not that big. Uh, let's take a look at this pro uh, flow and take a look at how the packet goes through. First of all, you need to understand there will be some type of routing that will happen, whether it's static, dynamic, where in which router one will know about two networks that are directly connected, which is going to be the 10 1 network off of E0 slash 0. Router one will also know about 10 10 network, which is E0 1. And it will learn N2 from some type of routing source via N10, N2. Agreed? At the same time, R2 will have a routing table which says. I'm connected to 10.2.2.0 off of E0 slash 1. I'm connected to 10.10.10.0 off of E0 slash 0. And I've learned about 10.1.1.0 via 10.10.10.1. Now, let's say PC1 wants to talk to PC2. What does he do first? The user pings 10.2, he creates a packet. What's the next thing that happens over here? I need to fill up the fields for what? Layer two. I send an ARP. No. I send an ARP over here. I'm on PC1 right now. R for what? What do I R for? I send a broadcast. Let's say I don't have the MAC address, but what do I broadcast for? Do I broadcast for the MAC address for 10.2.2.0? For 10.2.2.2? 
for the address of your default gateway. Why is that? Because through the ending process, I'll figure out the source and destination are on two different networks. My source is not on the same network as this guy. So I need to start for the default gateway. I'll find the default gateway MAC address, put it into my cache, the ARP cache, and put the addresses over here. Source MAC will be what? The MAC of PC1. And the destination will be the MAC of R1, P0 slash 0. Everybody okay with this? It will strip this off on R1. This is, as soon as it strips it off, it needs to figure out what? Where is 10.2.2.2? So what does it do? It goes to the routing table. What does it find in the routing table? In order to reach 10.2.2.2, the next stop is 10.10.10.2. So what does he do? Sends an ARP or checks the cache to find out what? The MAC address for which interface to find out, and then it also finds out what? The MAC address of the next stop for 10.10.10.2. And it rewrites, creates a new layer two header, and that layer two header will now be for, from where? MAC from R1 to MAC for R2. Everybody agree with that? This is known as a layer two rewrite. R2 gets it. What does R2 do with it? Again, strips off the layer 2 header. Checks what? The routing table. What does it find on the routing table over here? That 10222 is directly connected to E01. So now, because it's directly connected, it's going to send an R point finding the MAC address for PC2. Finds the MAC address of PC2. Puts the, creates another layer to rewrite in which it'll say, MAC for R2 as a source, MAC for PC2 as a destination, and sends it across. And the process is repeated on the return. Everybody okay with this? You guys understand that? Now, in process switching, this is exactly what happens. Packet comes in, router 2 receives it, it strips off what? What does router 2 do with this packet coming in. Let's take a look at the the steps. Step one, layer two strip. Two, destination IP check where? In routing table. This is on R1. I'm not talking about the, uh, the PC on the router. Step three. Layer two, rewrite. Because once I check the destination IP in the routing table, I'll find the next stop, find the MAC address, and do a layer two rewrite. If I send five packets, every packet goes through this on router one and router two. Good so far? This is known as process switching. Old. I said this is good, but it's, it's something that I can improve. So what improvement did they do? On R1, the first packet came in, it went through this process switching process. Once it figured that out, and it says, okay, I did write this packet, but I now know that if I want to reach 10.2.2.0, my layer two will look like this. You guys agree? Because the next packet will also have 10.2 going to this. So I know the MAC address is going to be what? R1 MAC, R2 MAC as the layer two rewrite. So it creates a cache. It's called the route cache. 
What's in the route cache? The destination address that was used and the corresponding layer to rewrite. This cache was built after the first packet went through. Okay. So what's the difference over here? Layer to strip. The route cache checked. Or L2 rewrite. To figure out the destination MAC address, I don't check my routing table. I'm just checking what? My cache. So I'm checking my routing table only on the first packet. Create the layer to cache, use the layer to cache for creating the layer to rewrite. Everybody okay with this? This is faster because I'm not going up to the layer uh, to my routing table to, to check what? My next talk and do that process. Good so far. So how many times does the routing table get used over here? Once on the first packet for every destination, not per packet. The first packet gets checked. The rest of the packets in the same flow, I'll check the route cache. Good so far? That's where they said this, well, this is great. Well, why do I want to wait for the first packet to come in? Why can't I do this proactively? I should be able to do this proactively. Rather than doing the first packet, checking the routing table, I know all the routes. I have a list of all my routes. I know their next hops. Let me create the layer to rewrite up front. As soon as my routing table is built, let me go ahead and create my layer to rewrite information. Why do I need to wait for the first packet to come in? I have the information already. All right? And that's what the next step is or the next uh, advancement is. So I went from where? Process switching where every packet checks the routing table to fast switching where the first packet checks the routing table in a flow to what is known as test switching, Cisco Express Forwarding. Everybody following along, guys? Okay, so this is called step switching. What happens in step switching is as soon as the routing table is built, it also builds what? For every destination, every network that you have, it builds what? A layer to rewrite. And as soon as the first packet comes in, it uses this table to forward the traffic. So my routing table is never checked. This table that is checked is known as a FIB. Forwarding information information. Yeah, they, every one of them have their own um, imp uh, implementation of express forwarding. All right? Everybody okay with this? So now my, if you look at the mindset, what's going on in, over here? I'm moving away from trying to eliminate 
not eliminate, but cut down on my check against my routing cable because it's a slow check. Okay? And I've evolved to what? To step switching using the fib. Let's write this down for you guys. Process switching. Every packet that went through the router was checked against the routing table before forwarding. What was the other one, guys? Help me out. The first packet gets checked against the routing table. Create a L2 rewrite cache. The following packet will use the L2 rewrite cache and not check the routing table. All right, and what was the third one? Set Cisco Express forwarding. Create a table known as the FIB proactively. The FIB contains information about all the destinations in the routing table. and their corresponding L2 rewrite caches. Yeah, the next up interface, the whole thing, the rewrite cache will contain. Good guys, everybody understand that. Is this new? FIP is there as a default for a long time. So most of the router that you have will be running step rather than running what? Process switching or fast switching. Good, everybody. Now, we understand that. What is my mindset over here? Mindset is to increase the speed, the performance. My routing protocols have stabilized now. I know there's no loops, loop avoidance is there. Everything is taken care of. Now my focus has been now more on what? improving the performance. And one such thing is moving away from checking a 32-bit address to a smaller address. And that smaller address is label switching. Let me explain that. When the packet came in, even with the FIB, when a packet came in, I needed to check what? The destination IP. against my fib, right? And then do the layer to rewrite. You guys agree with that? Okay. What's the size of your destination IP address? Thirty-two bits, right? So when a packet came in, it needed to check thirty-two bits to make a determination which layer to rewrite to use. They said, "Why can I make it in such a way that rather than using a thirty-two bit address, let me get a nickname or a shorter version of the IP address?" So what they did was they took the IP address, every IP address or network in your routing table and created or assigned it a nickname, every router on its own. 
independent of the other router, took every route in the routing table and assigned it a shorter name, a nickname. This nickname, initially Cisco, when it came up with this, was called a tag. Later on, it evolved into a label, which was a standardized version of it. The size of this label was 20 bits versus what? 32 bits. So every network in your routing table would be assigned a 20 bit label, which would be the shortcut or short name for that particular label. All that for just 12 bits. Is that a significant change? Saving 12 bits, is that a significant change? Yes, it is. How come? It's 12 bits out of what? I've changed out of 32. About a 37, 38% change, which is significant, right? You understand what I'm trying to get to? So yeah, it might seem like 12 bits, but it's 12 out of 32, which is a significant change. Make sense, guys? To improve the, improve the performance, it's a sizable change. And that is what label switching does. Or label switching was meant for, it does something else, and I'll show you something else later on. It allows you to do some other things. But understand this first. So what does label switching do? It cuts down your lookup from what? 32 bits? Initial mission was that. From 32 bits to what? 20 bits. A difference of 12 bits. Good? How? Let's take a simple network. I'll shut down the, these routers over here. Uh, let me use this topology over here. You guys, I need your attention for this. You'll be doing a lot of answering your questions in this. Oh, where'd I put it? Thinking cap one, yeah. Security resources. All right, let's open this up. <clears throat> so right now, I'm going to focus on this. R1 to R6, this network. The networks be between them, 
are 192.1.12.0. Twenty three dot zero thirty four dot zero forty five dot zero and fifty six dot zero. Each one has a loop back. These loopbacks are going to be x.0.0.0 .0 slash 8, where x equates router number. Fair, guys? Everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, Regardless of what the routing protocol is, what would my routing table look like on R1? So this is my routing table. How many routes would I have? One, two, three, four, five, and six. And I'll have the 12 network, 23 network, 34 network, 45 network, 56 network, right? the links between them. Agreed? Is that what I have? You see this? Now to make things simpler on yourself, I'll get rid of the links between them, but understand they're also there. Now it doesn't matter whether the route is directly connected to me or I learned it through a routing protocol. It's in my routing table, it's a route in my routing table. I'm going to assign a label to it. Good. R2. What do I have? Same route. You guys agree? You understand what I'm saying? I have the same route. Yes. For, on R1, C, uh, R1, network 1 will be a C. Two, three, four, five, six will be, let's say, EIGRP. R2, two will be C. One, three, four, five, six will be EIGRP. R3, one, two, three, four, five, six. Three will be directly connected. One, two, four, five, six will be routing. You have two connected on R2. Yeah. Yeah, the other ones I'm not putting, the 12, the 23, I'm not putting. Yes, they will be in your routing table. I'm focusing on the loopback. Otherwise, it'll be a too big of a task for you guys. You understand what I'm saying over here? Everyone will have the same routing table per se. Yes, some of the routes will be connected, the other ones will be learned. Good so far? Now the first job, as soon as I learn the routing uh, routes in my routing table, they go from the routing table into what? Into my FID. The routing table, the technical name for it is RIB. From the RIB it went to the FID. Okay? Now what happens is MPLS goes ahead and assigns every router, every router on its own will assign every route a nickname, which is known as a, the label. It's a local label that I call that route. So network one will have a local label, a number. This number 
is a 20 bit number. That gives you how many combinations? Two to the power of 20, which is roughly about a million combinations. A little over a million combinations. Is that good enough for a routing table? Would that be able to, could I assign a label to each and every route in a routing table? Million good enough? More than enough. This number starts from 16, goes to 1 million. The first 16, 0 to 15 are reserved. Absolutely. So good enough for a large table. So I'll pick a number and I'll start assigning the local label. So every router on its own will assign every route a local label. That basically is what I call or I see that route as. My name for that route, which is called the local label. What is it going to be over here? Let's start this as 20, local as 21, local as 22. Good. The other router will do the same, but he might pick the same number. He might pick a different number. It's completely in, independent of the other guy. Maybe let's say start, this guy starts at 25. So he'll have what? 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. Good so far? As long as the label is unique on my router, I'm happy. Router three, same thing. Let's say this started from 22. I'm doing this on purpose so you guys understand that it's completely arbitrary in terms of the labels that are being assigned. Said this started at 31. Oops. Just a nickname. R5, let's say 20. So R5 is the same. I'll keep it the same. R6, I'll start it at 31. Good so far, guys? Locally significant to the router, absolutely. Once I create this label, using a protocol, I am going to exchange these labels with my neighbors, with my directly connected neighbor using a protocol. Initially, Cisco came out with its own protocol, Cisco proprietary called TAG distribution protocol, where this was not called a label, it was called a TAG. And it eventually it evolved into what? An open standard, which was called LDP, label distribution protocol, where this was called a label. Good so far? So using LDP, forget about CDP now. Using LDP, now I'm going to exchange the label with whom? With my directly connected neighbor. Okay? I'm going to tell him what I call a particular route. So in case he wants to send me a packet for that particular route, he's going to send me the packet with that particular label. So help me build that. So what does router 2 send router 1? What does router 2 call 1? Come on, interaction. What does router 2 call 1? Do I have enough people over there? 
Oh yeah, plenty of people. So I need you guys to answer 25, right? So he will say, I got a remote label of 25 or one from where? R2. Similarly, I have a remote label of 26 from R2 or two. I have a remote label 27 from R2. I'm making you work like a, a device, like a router. And if you understand that, you will understand MPLS routing, the unicast router. Good so far? So router two told router one, hey, listen, if you want to get to two, please send me the packet using a label called 26 because I'm calling it 26. And similarly, R1 would send his labels to whom? His directly connected neighbor. Who's that? Who's R1's neighbor over here? R2. R1's neighbor, right? So, remote. What would this be on R2 from R1? 20, R1. 21 from R1. Twenty two from R one. Twenty three from R one. Twenty four from R one. Twenty five from R one. Good. Clear. Does R four get another label? For the same network from somebody else. Is there another neighbor for R2? R3. So what does R3 do then? R3 will send his labels to whom? R2 saying what? I call this guy as 22. Right? Let's do R2 first and then we'll do R4 as well. I call this as 23 from R3. You guys understand what I'm trying to accomplish over here? So everyone will know what the other guy, the directly connected guy, is calling a particular route. And I want you guys to make sure I don't make a mistake. So pay attention. I'm not the only guy that needs to work as a computer or a, a router. Good, everybody? Absolutely. It's not a routing table. It's a table. Yeah, it is going to be routing by rumor in that sense, yes. It's going to be a table that will have the labels assigned to it. Help me out with the label for this guy. Oops. On R3. He's going to get a remote label from whom? R3 will get it label get a label from two as well as from four. What is two called uh, net? One is 25, right? I don't know what it calls it, but I'll put the remote in here. Later on, we'll add. Remote is 26 or two, mar two. Remote is 27 to mar two. Mode is 28 from R2. Twenty nine from R2. I sometimes wonder where does it go in your brain, man? Cash. 
All right, so we got two done. Sorry, three with uh, remote of R2. Similarly, I'll have 31 onwards for R4. R4, 32. R4, 33, R4. Thirty-four R four. Thirty-five R four. This R four. Should be thirty-six. Done. Ignore the fat tree. Okay. Now help me out over here. I'm going to get it from R3. What is R3 called number one? R3 calls it 22. Regarding cash, I got two choices, process switching or dual CCA. Okay. Good, everybody. So that's four. I also uh, four from three. Similarly, from five, I'm getting twenty onwards, right? Twenty one. 22, don't fall asleep on me, 5, this is R2. Looks good. Okay. Remote from R4 <clears throat> is 31. Hey, go Bill, go Bill, man. That's good. You guys need to make sure I don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. See, I did it on purpose, man. I want to make sure that you're looking at what, what I'm doing. <clears throat> All right. So that's done. R5 now. Uh, I'm sorry, R6 now. Almost there, man. So R6 has starting at 31 as well, right? This 31, yeah, this is also 31. That's good. So this will be 31 from R6. from R6. Same label, no problem. No problem because it's associated with what? A particular next talk. Good. Now the last one. You'll only have one label. Why one label? You only have one neighbor, router six. Over here is only one label, starts at 20. R5. Now link local is different than IPv6. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, and twenty-five. Woohoo! What you guys did was you built a table known as the label information base or the lib. Everybody okay with this? Now take a look at something over here. Some of this information is not correct. If you take a look at router 2, it's telling router 1, sorry, I'm on router 2, right? Router 2, who's Three connected to three, right? But router one is giving him a label for it. Is that a good label or a bad label? If I'm on two, to get to three, I'll ne never go through R1. But I'm getting a label from R1 for what? Network three. You understand what I'm saying? Router 3 is connected, network 3 is connected behind R3, but R1 is saying, I can get you there with 22 as my label. I don't care about that. Why? Now, once I have this table information base, I'm going to consult my fib to figure out the best route. Whatever is the best route in my routing table or my fib, that's the label that I'm going to take and use it in my forwarding information. So, for example, network one is directly connected, right? I'm not going to use this label at all. This is my correct label. It's my own label. In my routing table, how do I reach network two? R2, right? This becomes my forwarding label. Come on. For network 3, I reach it through 2. So all these labels, because I'm using R2 as my next stop in my routing table or my FIB, this becomes my best label, the tick marks. Except for one, which is directly connected to me, all of the other labels are correct to what? R2, which is okay because I'm on the edge, so everything for me is this way. get that, I'll get to that point. 
I'm just building that table. So lib and fib are combined to find what? The best label. So I get the information from what? Lib and fib to get the best label. Got it, Bill? Let's analyze router two a little better because I have some routes from this way. Actually, let's go to the middle. Let's take a look at router three and tell me which labels will be used. One second, I just need to make sure I see everything over here. Tell me which label am I going to use? To get to one, which label am I going to use over here? Which is my best label? Looking, knowing the network. For one. To get to one, I need to go through R2. So the best label is? This guy, agree? How about for two? This label. No, for two, I'm on three. How about this guy? Network three. Local, right? How about four? How about five? How about six? You guys get the gist? So I'm going to take the best label and put it into my table, a new table called the label fib. A label fib or label forwarding information base, LFib, is a forwarding table that will use the label to forward. It will take the information from my lib and my fib, the next stop and the layer to rewrite from the fib and put it into one, one table called the LFib. Where my best labels are going to be put. Not all the labels, but just the best labels. What is that table called? The LFib. So let's build the LFib, and then I'll show you how to actually implement this whole story that I'm making up over here. LFib. What is the LFib? Let's take a look at the LFib over here. Network 1. I'm going to specify my local label, which is going to be, what is my local label for 1? 20. And if I want to reach 1, where do I send it? If a packet comes in, this is called the incoming, let me put the title over here as well, network, in label, which is local label, and out label, where if I want to send it to somebody, what's the outgoing label? I need to put the interface and the router. Call it next stop. So outgoing label, if a packet is received by me for network one, network one is over here, right? Network one is directly connected. Labeling is only from router to router. If there's a dead end over here, I'm going to send it to whom? To a device directly, which is going to be an unlabeled packet. So over here, 
I'm going to use the keyword unlabeled. No, not yet. Okay, interface, let's say this is loopback. Next stop, I don't have one, right? It's directly connected. How about for two? The in label is always my local label. What is the local label going to be over here? 21. What is the label for the out? If I want to go to two, what's the label that I want to use? Router two's label for two, which is 26. Twenty six outgoing interface E zero sky zero. This is where I'm going to send it to to R two three. My local label is twenty two. Outgoing should be twenty seven. Also E zero zero to R two four twenty three twenty eight E zero zero R two five twenty four twenty nine E zero zero R two. And last, 26, 25, slash 30, E00. Because in order to reach them, do you guys understand how I created this table? Yeses, please. If you don't understand, let me know. I'll explain it. Anything that you don't understand over here? Specifically, let me know on that. Stand up. Good? Okay. R2. Same type of table. Different information though. In for one, let's say what the in is. In means local. 25. To get to one, I need the label from R1, which is 20. So in label is what? Forgot. R2. In label is 25. Out is 20. Over here. 25 and 20. Interface is E0 slide 0. Next stop is R1. Good. Next one is 26, which is my local label. Actually, it's called untagged, but unlabeled is the same thing. Loop back. I am the local device. Three. Local, I'm going to call it 27. I'll just go do this because it is increasing by one locally, remotely. I'm on R2 right now. So two is done. So the remote labels I'm going to take for three, for three, four, five, six, which starts at what? 24. 24 for three, 25 for four, 26 for five, 27 for six. So 24 is the first one. E01. You guys understand this? So I'm basing this information off, off of my, what table? The lib table and the lib for the labels. Two is done. Let's take a look at three. So three, my local label is going to be Starting at 22, 27. So this number is 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. The out label for one or R3 is 2R2. So 25, even for two will be from R2. So 25 and 26. 25. And 26, E00 via R2. The 
this is going to be unlabeled. So the loop back. And this guy over here is going to be unlabeled. How about this one? Four, five, and six on R3. R3, four is remote will be to four. So 34, 35, and 36. 34, 35, and 36. P01 to R4. Wow, brilliant. Going faster, isn't it? R4. So on R4, the local labels are 31 to 36. And let's write them down. Okay, and the first three will come from R3. So on R4, the first three labels will be two, three. That's 22, 23, and 24. What happened? Okay. 22, 23, 24. P0 sky 0. And this guy is R3 all the way. And this is going to be that loop back. Good. How about this guy? Let's check five and six for R4. Five should be to R5, which is 24 and 25. 24, and this is 25, E01, to R5. R5, and almost there. So R5. Five is starting at twenty. And for R five, one, two, three, four should go to R four. So R four label start from thirty one, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. 31, 32, 33, and this is 34, all E0 sky 0, all to R4, and this guy is the which is going to be unlabeled. And the last one is 6, which is 36. E01, R6, and R6 now. Local starts at 31, and the remote starts at 20. This one will be 32, 33, 34, and 35, which will be 36. Local will be unlabeled. slash zero, and this is loop back. So we all are five. Whoa. 
Now, this is the way it works. Let's say a packet comes in, I'm sitting over here, and I say ping 6.6.6.6. It goes and checks, it hits the router. The router will check its else hit, where it sees the packet came in is destined for six. What's my outgoing label for it? 30, it creates a packet like this. I came in from one, destined to six. As soon as it sees the label 30, it puts the label 30 over here. And also because of the fib, although I didn't put it over here, it will have the entry for the layer to rewrite as well. So your layer to rewrite will also be in your LFIB, which would have source MAC of R1, destination MAC of R2. Good so far, guys? R2 receives a packet, first thing, strip layer two, gone. Check 30, again, because it's a label packet, it checks it against this 30 over here. What does it do with the 30? I really don't care about it. All I need to do is take 30 and swap it with what? 27. I don't check my route at all. All I'm doing is checking the label. If it's 30, I need to send it to 27. So what I'll do over here is swap the label with with 27 and along with that it would be your layer to rewrite which would say r2 to r3 forward it to whom r3 what does r3 do now help me out guys what does r3 do first strips layer 2 checks 27 against what R3 is checking 27, sees 27, swaps it with what? 36. Let's change it. Puts the layer 2 header. Sends. To whom? 4. 36, sorry, yeah. Just wanted to make sure you're up. <laughs> 36, what do I do with 36? What, what do I do? Strip this off, check 36 against 25. What I want you guys to see is I'm not checking anything beyond this. I'm checking up to what? The label, which is a 20-bit field. Good so far? Source map. Destination map. Now, this is what I want you guys to also realize over here is the last portion. When the router 6 receives it, he strips this off. What does he see over here? See the label packet. So if it's a label packet, it needs to check it against what? So I swap 35 with 36. R6 received it, checked it in the LFIB once. LFIB says what? 36, unlabel it, which is a pop action, unlabels it. Then it checks the, the FIB because now it's what? An IP packet. Before it was an MPLS packet. When you have a label on it, it's an MPLS packet. If it's an MPLS packet, I need to check the LFIB. If it's an IP packet, I need to check what? A fib. So what happens on the last router? Because it came in as a label packet, it needs to check the LFIB, sees it, 
strips off or pops the label, unlabels it, and then does what with it? Checks the fib because it's an IP packet where to send it. So how many checks on the last router? Two. The ELSIS and the, the fib. ELSIS because R5 send me the packet as a label packet. I strip that, check it, strip it off, then check the fib. Two lookups where on the last router. Check the 20 bit process and the, the actual process of the 20 bit on the last router is to do what? Unlabel it, right? In the, what's the process for 36? It says unlabel it, so it takes it off. You get my point? Once it labels, it takes it off, then it sees the IP packet. Now it needs to check the fit. So two checkups. They saw that as a, a hindrance or a performance hit. So because it's a performance hit, what they did was they said, well, if I know a route is directly connected to me, I know I'm going to be stripping the data off and forwarding the packet as an IP packet. So rather than me doing it, why don't I tell my router behind before me to do it for me? So I just get a normal packet, a IP packet. You get my point? So rather than R6 doing a two lookup, rather than having a label on it, if it's directly connected to me, I'm going to use a special label called the pop label. Pop means strip it off. So because 6 is directly connected to R6, rather than sending a normal label to its neighbor, he's going to send him a pop label. Pop label says what? Pop is basically an action to take it off. So it says pop it. Do you guys understand that? Because it's directly connected to me. So what's going to happen over here for network six when it came in? Now help me out. So what happened at five? Before five, let's go back to six. What would have, uh, uh, go back to four, what did four have done with the packet coming in? It would have received a packet for six with a label of 36. They would have swapped it with what? 25, right? Agreed? And then it would have sent it to whom? From four, it would have sent it to five. Five received it with 25. What do I need to do with 25? So 25, I need to send it to E01, to R6. But what's the label that I want to change it? It says pop it. Pop it means take it off. So now the packet will be a normal IP packet with a source MAC and a destination MAC. So when R6 receives a packet for a network that is directly connected to it, he's going to receive a normal IP packet. And if it's a normal IP packet, what's it going to do with it? It's going to forward the packet based on the, the fib. So the popping of the label, taking the label off, is not done by the last router, it's done by whom? The router before the last, and that is called the penultimate. Penultimate means the penultimate. The word penultimate means penultimate means the one before the last hop. The one before the last hop hopping or PHP. This is something that that is done automatically. I was just making you aware of it. Hop before the not the ultimate the uh, end. An ultimate pop popping. So that's why you see the pop over here. Good, everybody? Similarly, six over here. Sorry, uh, five over here will do what with it? 
because five is directly connected to five, what label will he send to him? So for five, this guy over here will be a pop. For this guy, it'll be a pop. You understand that? Because five is directly connected to five, so he would have generated a pop label instead. So this guy will be a pop label. This guy will be a pop label. You get my point. How about four? Four would have sent what? Pop to him. And four would have sent pop to three. Four is the net plus four. Good. How about three? Three would have sent pop over here. And three would have sent pop for this guy. And three would have, okay, mm -hmm. this is done. This guy two over here would have sent pop for what? Two to him. Okay. And he would have received pop from where? From R1. And he would have sent pop for this guy. I'll save this as Elfib lib table. So you guys will have this as well. Do you understand that? Now this is a huge story. How do I actually configure it? So configuring MPLS, unicast routing. Now that I've shown you guys how it works, let's take a look at the configuration. Configuration number one, configure a normal IGP between the routers. Okay. Let's take a look at how. Router 1, I would say router EIGRP. Let's run EIGRP as my protocol. I have network 1. And on router 1, I have 12. These are the two networks I want to run in EIGRP. Router 2. I have one, I uh, sorry, I have two, 12, and I have two and three, 23. R3, I have, actually, it should copy this. Oh. I have. 23 and 34. This is going to be 4. 4, 34, and 45. And this is going to be 5. 45 and 56. This is going to be 6 and 56. You guys get the gist of it? This is the configuration bit of it. Let's do it over here real quick. All right. Show IP. Interface brief. So set the network up real quick. I don't have all these other networks. So I'll just default them. E01, 2, and 3. I have one loopback. And I have the physical interface between R1 and R2. Once it is done, I can go over here and Configure my routing. So router one is here. Copy. Done. Router 
two. This guy is good. All IPs are right. So I'll copy this over here. EIGRP I'm using because it's faster to convert. So I have router one already. Let's go to three now. Three is also good. So I can copy the routing portion over here. Oops. So I should see all the way to one. There you go. Copy, let's go to four. Okay, time to default. Interface E0 slash one, two, and three. Interface E0 slash zero is going to be 34.4. And E01 is going to be 45.4. now should see all the way to one all good five 45 and 56 looks good so I can just copy this part should see all the way to one. And the last one is all six. Also good. So my routing is done. If I do a trace route from here to one, five, four, three, two, one. Good so far. So now I need to run MPLS Unicast Router. Step A, configure a loopback IP address as the router ID for RDP. This should be reachable unlike the router ID in no not necessarily 32 it doesn't have to be 32 it needs to be reachable just unlike OSPF where the router ID was just an ID here it is actual a reachability uh, address so I'm going to pick a loopback for example as my router ID and that loopback needs to be advertised in my IDP so LDP uses that to establish the neighbor relationship, unlike the other one. So over here, on all of them, I'll just say MPLS, LDP, router ID, let's say loop back here, on all of them. Okay, this is how you pick it. Good. Just make sure I'll put a note over here. This loopback needs to be reachable. Good, everybody. That's step one. Step two, and the only other step, enable MPLS, which by default uses LDP as a protocol on the interface connecting towards a LDP neighbor. And I'll automatically run LDP and exchange the labels, the whole table stuff that I showed you for the last hour will be done immediately by LDP. It will assign the local labels and exchange the labels with the neighbors. How do I do it? On router one interface E0 slash zero because R1, if you take a look at our topology, only has one neighbor. 
who's one who's my one neighbor on e0 towards r2 r2 will have two neighbors r3 will have two neighbors r4 will have two neighbors five will have two neighbors six will have one so the only place that i need to enable mpls on is the interface towards the ldp neighbor so on r1 and r6 i'll just put it like this mpls ip and i'll automatically run ldp as a protocol on the other routers which are r2 to r5 i need to do it on not only on this interface but also on what the other interface because i have two interfaces in this case interface e0 slash one mpls Start with R1, copy, R6, copy. So two through five on both interfaces. And notice as soon as I do that, my neighbor with one comes up. Go to three, my neighbor should come up with two. Go to four, should come up with three. Go to five come up with four and six because six is already there and it's done so how do I verify it to display the lib which have all the labels the good and the bad show NPLS LDP binaries let's check let's check it on R2 Show MPLS LDP bindings. So you guys remember what I told you? You have one network, right? One local label, remote label. Remote label implicit now is your pop label. I have one received from where? Router one and router two, three. Which one would I select as the best label? Because one is reachable via one. On In my FIB, I'm gonna pick this label as my best label. And this is the label, the pop label, that will go into my LFIB. I'll show you the LFIB in a second as well. But I have both the labels over here. So on router two, I'm also gonna have a label for what? Two, local is implicit now, meaning what? It's directly connected, that's the pop. And I've received a label from the other two guys. I'm not going to use any of those two labels. Why? Implicit null is my pop label. So it should be the one that takes precedence because this guy in my routing table is directly connected. For network three, local label is 17. I've received the label of implicit null from three and from one. Which one do you think I'll pick among these two? For network three, I'm sitting on two. Help me out, guys. Which one? Hello, hello. I'm sitting on two. The network is three. I have two labels, one from one, one from three. I'm going to pick the implicit null. Why? In my routing, in my fib, it shows R3 as the correct next hop. Good, everybody? This is what your lib looks like. And I showed you a similar type of thing in your notes app that I created for you guys. Okay, next, how do I check my lib? And let's follow that. Sorry, LFIB. Show MPLS forwarded label. One is directly connected, so I, I'll never receive a packet that's going to be what? Label, so I take it off. But take a look. If I want to go to two, what's my outgoing label for it? Pop. Why? Two is directly connected to. R2, R2 would have sent me a pop label for it. That's what I meant, outgoing interface, call two. For 17, I'm going to, uh, for, sorry, for three, I'm going to set 17. For four, I'm going to send 18, 5, 19, 6, 20. These are my outgoing labels. So let's say I was going to do a ping to six. What's my outgoing label going to be? 
Come on, interactive over here. What's the label going to be? 20. So this 20 should be the local label for 6 on where? On R2. Because he's going to receive it as 20. He's going to swap it with the local label for R3. I can find that out over here. Show MTLS forwarding table. So I know if I receive a 20, I need to swap it with what? Outgoing label 20 for network 6 and send it to whom? R3. R3 is going to get 20. What is R3 going to do with it? He gets 20. He's going to again swap it with 20 and send it to what? 4. Because they went in the right order. Like they all started with 16. That's why the numbers are the same. 4 gets it. What does 4 do with 20? He swaps it with 20 and sends it to whom? 6. Sorry, sends it to 5. 5 receives it. Now, you tell me, what should 5 do with it? 5 is directly connected. He's the PHP over here. So when he receives 20, he's going to pop it. Make it into an IP packet, send it to whom? R6. R6 will not have an entry for what? 6. It will be missing because he knows he's never going to get a packet that is going to be labeled for 6 because he sent an implicit null to everybody else. Can you see this? Absolutely. Trace route. 6.6.6.6 six dot six dot six dot six source 111. Show. See this? Label 20, 20, 20, 20. On the last leg, it's a pop. Good, everybody? So that is MTLS Unicast routing for you guys. A deep dive into it in the sense that I wanted you guys to see what happens actually inside the hood so you understand when you look at the output what's going on over there why are you seeing a label over there if you're not seeing a label over there that means there's something wrong there's something that is missing in the middle so for example troubleshooting let's say I go to router 3 and I have forgotten on e01 to do MPLS IP so I'll do no MPLS IP over here between what 3 and 4 because E01 is between 3 and 4. So now if I do a trace route over here, take a look what happened. Labeled over here, labeled over here. See, there's no label between what? 2 and 3 because it received it. There was no label on it. It bought it back into an IP packet, then got labeled again. What does that tell you? This is something wrong. This is not a good, good sign. That means there's something going on over here that's not right. That's where you... Should be back now. So you understand this? Good, every you guys understand this, right? <clears throat> In terms of the commands, it's very simple. You, I just want you guys to see not just the commands, but also what's going on in the, the background. Now, the importance of it. And this is what I want you guys to understand. Why is MPLS unicast routing so important to 
your ISPs. By the way, this is called MPLS Unicast Routing. Why is it so important to ISPs? Understand that. You guys remember early on we talked about MP, uh, the M, uh, your IBGP reduced processing. Yeah, we've done one reduced processing because of what? Twenty bit versus thirty two bit because I'm not checking the IP address at all. Where am I checking the IP address? I'm checking it on R one. And I'm then checking it on R6. In the middle, it's just a label lookup. Good. Now let's go back to our earlier, uh, what do you call it? Setup where remember I told you that a typical service provider setup is you have multiple edges, okay? And you have your route reflectors. I just put one, so it eases it out. So you're running BGP from the edges to whom? Towards the route reflector to exchange the route. Good so far? This is, let's say, router one, NAS one, router two, NAS AS two, router three, and I have router four. I receive a route over here, network one zero 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 slash eight. Who do I send the route to? The route reflector. He has the route. He will propagate the route to B. He will propagate the route to C. He will propagate the route to D. So all of them, B, C, and D have 1.0.0.0 slash 8 via router, uh, router 8. Agree? Or oh, what did I tell you earlier on that you can put another device, a fast key device over here? That is not for the BGP route, that's just for what? Next hop reachability. So D can reach A through this. So if it was a normal packet, let's say network four wanted to go to, to one. Four sends it to A, D. He says one is reachable via what? A, correct? A meaning what? Let's say this is 10.1.1.1. And my Nexus router over here, would say 10.1.1.1 is reachable via A. So now in my routing table, I will also have a IGP route for what? 10.1.1.0 reachable via whatever the thing is through the Nexus. When this packet, what this does is basically says source MAC is uh, D, destination will be the Nexus sends it to the Nexus, it's an IP packet. No, let's say it's the Nexus running routing. Okay, sends it, sends it to the Nexus, which is gonna strip off this guy. Now what does it expose over here, the IP packet, right? Does this guy know about 1.0.0.0 slash 8, the Nexus? His job was just to provide reachability of the routers. His job was not to run BGP. This is a BGP route. You understand what I'm saying? This is a BGP route. This guy is not running BGP. The packet over here is four to one. So when the layer two is stripped off, it needs to check the fib for one. He will not see one in the fib because he is not running what? BGP, that's the whole purpose to segregate the data plane and the control plane. So what would I do to make it work? I would need to have BGP run on this guy as well. 
but he knows about one. So I would end up running BGP on all the different devices, which is not a good thing. Now, what I do over here is I run MPLS instead. Let me explain that. So over here, let's say I am going to run BGP. Take a look at this. It is a very interesting and nice setup that might explain the importance of MPLS to you guys. I have this AS over here. Let's say AS1000 or AS700. I have another one over here. AS800. This guy in the middle is AS1000. But I don't want to run BGP on all the core routers. I only want to run it where? On the edges. I want to run eBGP over here. Let's write it rather than keeping it like that. I want to run eBGP over here. No, this is not a PE router. PE come, stands for provider edge. This is a service provider. This is an ASVR. Connecting one autonomous system to another autonomous system. That is MPLS VPN that you're talking about. I'm not doing MPLS VPN over here. So eBGP over here. And then I'm only going to run IBGP from R1 to R6. Only on R1 and R6. Not on the middle routers. I don't want to run... Uh, BGP on the middle routers. I only want to run it where? Between R1 to R6. Okay? The middle routers are not aware of those devices, but I'm running what? MPLS unicast routing over here. Let's take a look at it. Let's prove that. So I'm going to go to router 1, and I'm going to run an eBGP neighbor relationship with R7. Let's do that over here. I need to get 8 as well. So I'll go to 1. Try P interface 3. Call that 1. Interface E0 slash 1. I'll say is 17.1. I'm going to run run router BGP 1000. Neighbor is going to be 17.7, .7, remote AS 700. Okay. Let's go to 7. I have 17.7 .7 and 7. So router BGP 700. Neighbor 17.1, remote AS is 1000. And my network that I want to advertise is 7. Good. The neighbor is up. If I go to 1, I should see the BGP route 7 over here eventually. Still coming through. While it's coming up, I'll do the neighbor relationship between 6 and 8. 6 and 1,000 and 8 and 800. Router BGP 800. Network 8. Neighbor 192.168.6. Remote AS is. Last video. Okay. You guys see it now? You guys understand what I did on 8? I set up a EBGP neighbor relationship towards. Six. I haven't say, done six yet. So six, I'm going to do that. Make sure my interfaces are there. 68.6 .6 is there. Router BGP 1000. 
neighbor 68.8 mod as 800 good so show ip bgp i see the eight routes if i go to one show ip bgp i should see the seven routes everybody okay with this what have i done at this point i've set up a ebgp name relationship this guy has seven I've set up an EBGP name relationship. This guy has eight. Now I'm going to set up a IBGP name relationship between what? One and eight to exchange the routes all the way across over here. These guys have no idea about those routes, but I'm going to set up a name relationship directly from one to six. Let's do that. So I'm on one neighbor. 6.6.6.6. Remote AS is also 1000. I'll do an update source to back zero and next stop set. I don't have a route reflector in the middle. I did it directly from edge to edge. So now I will go to six. Neighbor 1111. Remote AS is 1000. My update source. Is loop back zero. Did I do it right over here? Yep. And I want to do next stop self clear it because I did the next stop self after the neighbor came up. All right. So show IP BGP. Now on router six, I see seven reachable via what? One. Eight reachable via sixty-eight dot eight outside my AS. On R1, try PBGP, the two edges, seven and eight again. Seven reachable via the external, eight reachable via six. Show IP route BGP. Seven is reachable via 17.7, .7, which is on the outside, and eight is reachable via 10, uh, via 6666. Everybody okay with this? You guys understand that? Does router two know about six? Sorry, does router two know about seven and eight, these two external networks? Let's check. Try P route. Got a big routing table. Check for seven. There's no seven. How about eight? There's no eight. How about three? Nothing. Eight. Nothing. None of them do, know it. Not there. not there present in any of the the middle routers but if i go to seven try p route i say bgp i do see eight and if i do a trace to eight 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 source of seven 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 it's gone up to four and it'll eventually come to Sometimes this IOU gives you a timeout on one of the middle routers, but it's getting there. It's making it to the end. So if I do a ping, from seven to eight, I am pinging from where to where, guys. I'm pinging from this guy over here to that guy, pinging eight over here without these guys in the middle knowing about eight. How is it possible? How, how did it work? Because the packet needs to go from R1 to R6. There's no other route but to go to what? Of uh, the middle routes. The beauty of MPLS, the way it works. When I send the packet over here, 
on when I created the packet on seven, it had a source of seven and a destination of eight. It checks the routing table on seven and see, let's check what it says. I'm gonna follow the packet and make you understand this. So if I check my thing, it says eight is reachable via what? 17.1, simple, so I'll send it to router one. Router one checks show IP route, BGP. Seven is reachable, sorry, eight is reachable via what? 6666, six is not directly connected. So it checks my MPLS table to see if six is there. What does it see for six? It sees the outgoing label is 20. So it creates it as a label packet. So going back over here to my diagram, this packet goes to one. When it went to one, it went normal. Source of R7, destination of R1. One receives it. What does one do with it? Strip this off. One gets it. It puts the label on it as 20. And then puts the R1 to R2. When R2 receives it, what does R2 do with it? R2 strips the layer two off, sees a label packet. It doesn't check the IP. You get my point? Strips the label, uh, the layer two off, checks the label, it's a label packet, so it's gonna swap it. And it's gonna swap it with whatever the label is 20 for, that has to be swapped for 20, which is 20 again. Swaps it again, sends it over here, swaps it here, sends it to him, he swaps the label and sends a packet as an IP packet to the edge device, which is R6. Now, at this point, it does an IP lookup, but he is aware of eight. How come? Because I'm running eBGP with the edge, and he will receive it. So my core over here is not running BGP. This is called a BGP-free core. Possible only because of NPLS unicast routing, which allows you the ability to avoid doing a layer three lookup in the middle. Yes, it does have an advantage of what? 20 bit lookup over what? Over a 32 bit lookup. But that was the initial, uh, what do you call it? The initial objective of doing NPLS, but this became the main objective now, in the sense that I do not need to do a layer three lookup through the core, it gives you a lot of flexibility of connecting the edges to each other without running BGP in the core. And this is exactly how ISPs are doing it right now. Do you understand that? So every ISP that you go to will be running MPLS unicast routing, whether they're doing MPLS VPNs or not, which is a different story, different uh, lecture, but MPLS unicast routing, all the ISPs will be running. Just because they want to, they don't want to run BGP on each and every device. They run it on the edges. They run it on their con control plane, which is your route reflectors. They do not run BGP on your data plane traffic. They just get the next stop reachability, the NL, all right, the next route reachability is there through your IGP and the IGP along with MPLS will allow you to run the core without BGP. Good? That's my version of MPLS unicast routing. Save this. <laughs> okay, but it's recorded, hopefully. Thank you. Katie, you, you're there? 
are sleeping now. We really need to thank her for organizing this. Sure. All right, guys, uh, this is it. I'm going to upload the documents, these two documents. I'll actually do it right now. Uh, the notes and stuff I will do right now. But save the video. You need to have Katie do that. Thank you guys, thank you. Appreciate it. Most of you guys know about the annual package. So you send me emails. If you need any more information, you have my email address. Please send it to me. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care guys, good night. All right, Katie, I'll see you guys. Do that. Bye now. Let me upload this. Upload. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, guys. I will say it. Day five. What else do I need? Thank you, Ed. All right. They're uploaded. Uh, the documents should be uploaded. The only thing that will be missing is the video. So that you need to hit KD up for. Maybe on uh, Router Drops. Good night.